Good evening. This is the Ridgewood Village Council Public Workshop Agenda. The date is April 3rd, 2023. The time is 7.30. Adequate notice of this meeting has been provided by a posting on the bulletin board in Village Hall, by mail to the Ridgewood News, the record, and by submission to all persons entitled the same as provided by law of a schedule including the date and time of this meeting. Roll call. Deputy Mayor Perrin. Here. Council Member Reynolds. Here. Council Member Weitz. Here. Council Member Winograd. Here. And Mayor Vagianos. Here. Will you all please join me as we salute the flag? We will now take public comments. Linda Scarpa, 569 Northern Parkway. I'd like to recognize these fine people behind me. I came in like an old lady taxpayer screaming that I thought I wasn't going to get heard, and they were kind enough to let me go first. So I want to applaud you guys because you were very nice to me. I do too. Thank you all so much. That's, that's being really, really nice. and. You don't get that often anymore. No, let's, we're, we're getting it more and more. Okay. I've lived in Ridgewood for 40 years, raised three kids as a single parent, and now live on a pension from the state of New Jersey. I have no cost of living, and I'm on a fixed rate annuity. Needless to say, it's difficult to live here on a fixed income. Inflation is 7%. The current budget is slated at a 4.88 increase and does not include the school taxes, which will no doubt be added. We need a bottom line. I need a bottom line what my taxes are going up to be with the school tax, even if it's an estimate, because the schools had to submit their taxes this past Friday, March 31st, so that I could give you a roundabout estimate. I did look at the PowerPoint and the revenue needs. First is the revenue changes. In comparing last year's tax to be raised to this year, the amount to be raised is an increase of $1 $142,172. The average tax assessed on a home valued at $702,349 is $4,917, and I should tell you the comparison for last year was blank. This does not include school tax, so it's not a fair increase. Salary and wages increase, the salary and wages increase in the village is $1,039,138. That's a 4.32%, which in my opinion is a whopping sum. Total salaries, pension, health insurance, terminal leave is 67.8% of the total budget. We're going in the wrong direction. I have to say it, we are. We're all in a budget crunch here. Things have to change. It is highlighted, I have to say this, it's highlighted in the third bullet on point three, and I quote, successfully transitioned all weekday and Saturday daytime calls for both ambulance and EMS to the fire department. This allows better use of personnel who are already being paid, that's true, and has eliminated the need for paid daytime EMT. The facts first, because everyone knows this was my champion. EMT were a vibrant, integral part of our first responders. After they were defunded by the previous administration, 80 to 90 percent of the low paid per diem EMTs with zero benefits and pension left, and you can't get them back. This resulted in the remaining EMTs to do double shifts while working full time. The fire people were forced to take the shifts and get paid for it. These additional civil service workers, and I was one of them, a civil service worker, cost taxpayers years of pension, benefits, increments, and stipends. This is hardly an accomplishment and definitely not a saving. Something has to change. Lastly, I'd, I would like to say I invited all of you to Law Enforcement Appreciation Sunday. I'd appreciate it if you all come. It's honoring police and fire from three different uh, towns. We're having color guard and cakes and all sorts of stuff, ribbons. So I hope you all have an, have an opportunity to spend one hour, one hour, to honor first responders. Thank you so much. Thank you, Linda.
Um, Susan Moran, 705 Kingsbridge Lane. Oh. Go ahead, Susan. No, no, um. You can begin whenever you're ready. Susan, you can begin whenever you're ready. Let's just try to make a point. I think. Susan, do you have something to say? Yeah. <clears throat> I just I'm waiting. I would just advise the mayor that it's proper for us to take three minutes from everybody else's time no, and I just know. let somebody remain silent. So if you could speak, no, let I, us know. The reason I remain silent is we come here every week and um, we express our concerns and our questions and no one answers our questions. There is no dialogue with residents. There is no, um, there is really no reason to speak with the results are the same. Long before the new council was sworn in, plans for Shadler were predetermined. The plans were not based on facts, desires, or needs of the community. Any desire to adhere to the direction of SHPO and the state, any interest in what is going on from national perspectives with the respect of history of this country. There is, <clears throat> and as you saw, that's what we have, the silence. You guys give us silence. Um, we really are not sure who the council is following and why. Um, there is not logic, real analysis, or any interest of Ridgewood in the whole. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Cynthia O'Keefe, 542 West Saddle River Road. As you know, I'm part of the Shedler community, and I am in support of a small grass field. I think by now we know that a large turf field compromises the health and safety needs of the residents of Ridgewood, not just for the people who live there, but for visitors. So on one hand, we listen to um, most of you up there, in the council and you've expressed that you would like a full size, you potentially a full size turf field um, to enable children in Ridgewood to have physical fitness and, and get outdoors. That's great. But when we talk about the health and safety issues that are affecting and will affect the Shedler community, we can't just look at that as the only viable option. So we know that a large field is almost three times the area of a small 75 by 50 foot field. And this will, um, obviously we've, we talked about cutting down the trees and cutting down more trees. So many trees have already been cut down. Um, it's the only natural barrier that the people who live there have from Route 17, from the particulates coming off the highway. I think we're all reasonable people and this is logical. This makes logical sense to look at other alternatives. There are other towns that are exploring organic turf fields. So, you know, we keep talking about an artificial turf field. I've stood up here numerous times over the last several weeks and talked about the well waters. There are fam five families that use well water. Um, I think that we need to look at other alternatives and use this as an opportunity for to, to be you know, uh, smart and sustainable. We talk about all of these great initiatives that are going on in Ridgewood, and we have to walk the talk. We're not doing that. Or at least I haven't seen an example of it yet. And I hope to, because I have confidence that you will come to the right decision and, and care about people who are up here week after week pouring their hearts out to you. So I think that the large field, we, we know there are gonna be 
you know, potential traffic accidents coming off, you know, people speeding off of Route 17. I see it every single day. I invite all of you to come down and witness for yourself what it looks like on that road. You know, I would hate to see an accident um, that could be easily avoided by not making this decision. And I thank you for your consideration and I hope, I implore you to do the right thing. You're intelligent people, and I think that if you look back and look at decisions maybe you made in the past that weren't so great, use it as, a, as an opportunity to make the right decision for people. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Good evening, my name is Christina Million. I live at 530 West Saddle River Road. I'm in support of a small grass field and I'm also in support of prioritizing resident safety and building sidewalks on West Glen Avenue. Tonight I want to take a moment to recognize the credible and qualified historic organizations that have written to you over the past few weeks. They represent organizations with trustworthy experts who have dedicated a good portion of their professional lives to history. Organizations like the New Jersey Society of the Sons of the American Revolution, the Bergen County Historical Society, Crossroads of the American Revolution, and the National Parks Conservation Association. These knowledgeable and accomplished professionals have stressed the importance of following the recommendation by Hunter Research that an archaeological survey be completed if significant ground disturbance is planned at the historic Shedler property. These organizations have also stressed to you that the completed archaeological survey would be opportune for Ridgewood to recognize and celebrate its history at the significant time as we lead up to America 250, which is only three years away. In regards to making money, the Historic Trust of New Jersey recently announced the Heritage Tourism of New Jersey study that found that almost 10 million people have visited the Garden State thanks to its rich, rich history and practical preservation, which brought in roughly $3.9 billion and created 50,000 jobs for this state. This included on-site spending not only at heritage sites, but off-spending at local businesses, like going out to dinner afterwards, it's restaurants. Credible historians play such a crucial role in preserving the accuracy and integrity of historical sites and records. They use their skills to meticulously research and analyze and interpret history, ensuring that they prioritize accuracy and honesty. And without credible historians, historical artifacts could be distorted or lost, leading to a skewed understanding of the past, which in turn could have a negative consequence for Ridgewood's present and its future. And as every town in America is embracing its rich history and gearing up for America 250, I would sure hope that we would proactively participate, it, participate in it as well. Thanks. Thank you, Christina. Matthew Rossi, 516 West Saddle River Road. I'm here today to talk about the recent idea to increase the field size at Shedler. We've had many talks asking for expert studies related to safety, noise, traffic, historic preservation, and most notably, if a large turf field may contaminate my family's well water. We've been told we won't slow the project with more studies. Ironically, the only expert study being entertained is how to remove the his historic designation from the property. The fact that the council will study this instead of my family's safety and well-being is troubling. Since previous calls for safety concerns fall on deaf ears, I hope you don't mind tonight if my remarks are a little more philosophical. Tonight, I ask you to consider the words of Cicero, more is lost from indecision than wrong decision. I realize the council is trying to make several segments of our village happy. I believe that each and every one of you are good moral people. But we have a 2017 plan in place. Please execute it, don't reinvent it. Sure, not every detail is laid out, but the spirit of the plan is clear. A small field, path, and playground. Right now, I ask you to step back and realize in trying to appease all segments of our village, you're in a state of indecision. As a member of this community, I'm offering you insight if the council continues down this path. The, the community is becoming organized. Take a drive down many of our streets. Protests are forming, lawn sites are up, people are angry. We talk about SHPO during these meetings. But now neighbors talk to SHPO directly, and a small field seems much more in line with SHPO's views on historic preservation. Attorneys are being interviewed by neighbors, and if you split a legal bill 50 ways, it's not such a big number. And funny enough, a case as just as ours might even warrant some pro bono work. That means roll up your sleeves, extend your timeline, and your budget. News outlets are starting to listen to our story. I'm sure you've seen them. 
The point is we are motivated, we are dedicated, and more importantly than that, we are on the side of right, health, and safety. If the council votes on a large field, I'm here to tell you that's probably your smallest hurdle because that's just the starting line for us. Councilman Weitz, you mentioned that you would only work towards a plan that could be completed expeditiously. Councilwoman Winograd, you ran on a comp campaign of completing this project. Realize each change implemented makes the project less realistic. Think about it. The village hasn't been able to restore a tiny house on time or on budget. Do you think expanding the scope of the project will help get it completed faster? Realize that the neighbors are dug in and your path, the path you're exploring won't happen fast, cheap, or possibly at all. But again, let's be positive. I believe the council to be of good moral compass. We are here to urge you, let's work together. Execute something that resembles the 2017 plan, and I promise you that a majority of the neighbors will be promoting you, not protesting you. If we need a larger field, there are a lot of other locations we can explore together. But for Shedler, inst install a small field, walking path, and playground for my kids. While they're still kids, thank you. Thank you, Matt. I should start? Sure. Okay, great. My name is Fretra De Silva. I live at 521 West Saddle River Road. I'm in support of a small grass field. Um, I'm coming here because the information um, regarding, um, there's been a lot of information or concerns that have been raised regarding the demand for additional fields. And some information has been provided to the public, but it's mostly numbers about the number of, of, of uh, players. There's no specific data demonstrating increased need over time or outlining a change in the flood patterns. There's no data that has been provided showing Council's review of current field improvements and the cost comparison of such activities with destroying this historical site. There's been no data that has, been sh that has shown to demonstrate the actual impact that this one single field will have in connection with the tremendous need that's been expressed. Until real analysis is conducted, the statements about a need for more fields is kind of like a dream or a desire. But there are some facts that I believe the, the, the council should consider. And those are the, the information that's been provided over and over again about the increased risk, health risks that a large turf field can introduce to this community. There have been studies that have been presented from Mount Sinai and other medical institutions regarding the links of links to multiple breeding and cancer risk with turf fields. There have been articles from unions of professional athletes have, that, who have protest, protested the use of turf fields. There have been articles about six, linking six Phillies players' death with a unique brain cancer to the use of turf fields. Cities in Massachusetts, Connecticut, and California have banned turf fields because of documented health risks. There have been multiple studies presented to the council from Moms Teams Institute of Youth Sports Safety and Safe Healthy Playing Fields, Inc., writing regarding increased injury risk associated with these types of fields. One health risk or health need that hasn't been expressed that I would also urge you to consider is the need for passive recreational uh, fields or, or space. There is no other passive recreational area on the east side of Ridgewood, a real health need of young families and adults, especially seniors. Seniors compose about 14%, I believe, of the population of Ridgewood. A large field takes away any significant walking path, which would be a material health benefit to adults, especially seniors. Let's not forget that part and that chance to, uh, to address a health need for that part of our community. So I would urge you to consider the real facts and the information that's been presented by professionals and not necessarily the anecdotes and the, uh, the undocumented, uh, undocumented um, information about field demand. Thank you. Thank you, Fretcher. Before my timing starts, I won't, I'll mention my name when the timing starts, but this gentleman in the blue shirt and the tie was taking pictures of us outside. I don't know who that is. 
And I don't know whether he's allowed to take pictures like that. Um, Matt, maybe you're the... Okay, could you at least identify sure, him? Sure, that's me? Peter Primavera. Peter Primavera. Peter Primavera, okay. All right, very good, thank you. So it's noted, right, that he was taking pictures of us outside. Okay, so Rohan De Silva, 521 West Saddle River Road. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, so I used to be in support of a small turf, a small grass field. But actually, I'm more in support of a community garden, which actually is what Shippo thinks is more in concert with the historical designation. So while I'll compromise, I want a community garden, but if it'll help the village, and I'll compromise, and I'll go to a small turf field. But I really want a community garden. Okay, so a large turf field does not satisfy SHPO's standard. The council is moving forward with plans that increase the field size by almost three times the area with potentially turf, netting, and lights. On the, on the other hand, SHPO has stated that turf will require a higher level of review, which means increased time. The increase in field size takes away any material buffer between the field and the historical house, which is by definition encroachment requiring a higher level of review. Again, more time. Turf, netting, and lights change the character of the property, which by definition is encroachment of the historical desig historically designated property requiring a higher level of review. Again, more time, more money. Time is money, right? We all hear that. The change to a large turf field will only require Shippo, Shippo to seek approval from uh, the higher authorities, which means more time and more money. There are many inconsistencies in the village council. The village council is in support of the cancer awareness and program that they had a few weeks ago. But on the, other, on the flip side of that, the council is willing to expose the Shedler community to um, carcinogens and other contaminants and particulate matter. Two, the council supports the green space or the green plan, but you cut down all the trees at Shedler, or a lot of them, not all, certainly. Uh, more importantly, this is a complete change to the character of the property but more importantly for the town, we all moved into the town for the community, the village of Ridgewood, uh, so that we can enjoy a peaceful uh, area to be. And lastly, we've been pitted against the sports thing, the teams or sports groups. We are not against the sports groups. We would like to work with the sports groups to find an appropriate place, but Shedler is not it. Thank you. Thank you, Rohan. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Linda Koch, Your Honor, members of the council. Um, I am here in favor of open space. Do you know the market race? You know the market race? Well, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. But indulge me in a little anecdote. Um, when I was a teenager, I was tapped to be a coach of little girls' soccer. We, I didn't know a blasted thing about soccer, and not many of us did because this was in the 70s, and especially girls weren't really privy to playing soccer. So I have a ball, I got these little girls, and I'm trying to read up on the rules, I'm trying to read up on the strategy, and I'm trying to get across these girls, and, and it was like, what? You want the ball? Here you go. And these kids just did their own thing. Was it soccer? Hell no. It was a little bit of Red Rover, it was a little bit of tag, it was a little bit of, of this and that. And these kids had a ball. They had a ball. And they did their own thing. And that was the market race. What, what's that? You want to do it again tomorrow? Why not? Do it again tomorrow. And I am in favor of this sort of thing. My name is Linda Koch, and I am in favor of free play. Because you know what kids are good at? Kids are good at being kids. 
And what can we give them? The opportunity to do just that. Take the rules and throw them out because when they figure it out as young kids, they will figure it out as adults. And we're doing our job. Thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. Uh, Rurik, Hollaby, 1 Franklin Avenue. Uh, I'd like to give a pat on the back to the mayor for the cl classy way you introduced the solution to the furlough problem. You put Pam, Heather, and Bob front and center and gave them all the credit. No chest beating, no arm waving by you, no me, 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 me. Now we all know how hard you must have worked to affect that solution. Thank you, Paul, for being a class act. Now, I can't say the same about Lorraine's comments, basically stating that were it not for the presence, I, I will, con she's made a comment, I'm addressing that. <coughs> for let's the presence be, of employees work, at the meeting. Work. Let's be respectful. According to our village attorney, when someone on the dais says something, I'm allowed to address it. You, you are. I'm okay. just saying be respectful, please. I am being very respectful. Thank you. She was not respectful to you, in my opinion. Okay? So let me st start the thing from scratch. I can't say the same about Lorenz's comments, basically stating that were it not for the presence of employees at the meetings, four of you would have done nothing to come up with a solution. That was a nasty thing to say, and frankly, Loren owes every one of you a, an apology. Now, you have dodged the bullet as far as the budget, but the solution is a short-term one that does not address the systemic, long-term financial challenges that Rigid faces. I urge you to reconstitute the Financial Advisory Committee and to embark post-haste on a thorough review of the budget. Start out by looking critically at every department Undertake a zero-based budget process. Everything, nothing sacred. The police department, fire department, park and rec, you name it, should be looked at from scratch. In the time being, please ask Bob Rooney to have a town hall meeting to present the budget to the public in a give and take session. I'll be happy to discuss this with Evan. Regarding Shadler, as I've said on many occasions, we need a forensic auditor to review every penny spent on the project, and the forensic attorney to find out when, how, and if the village council approved applying to SHPO for a historic designation of the house. Just as an aside, uh, I have a hard time getting my head around spending $2.6 million on renovating a house, that house. It is just insane. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rourke. This will be our last commenter for this public uh, comment Gruber, period. 229 South Irving. Um, I'm here about one of your policy items, accepting a contribution, a, dis a, 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 a contribution from the Zabriskie Shedler House. In March 11th, 2002, we gave $40,000 to the village. We gave it to finish the house for a kitchen or whatever, and you cashed the check or deposited the check on March 17th. Why, I understand, I can't find the resolution, so I don't know if you ever did it or didn't do it, but I think it's very weird that you're bringing it up tonight. You did accept the money. We gave it with our full heart. We had raised it, and we wanted to give it to the house. Why are you bringing it up, if I may say, right next to Councilwoman Rennie Brad's whatever donation she made? It's very, I don't understand why it's under policy. I don't think you can answer me under this, but it's very strange when I saw it, I was a little bit surprised. And I also, Heather, I didn't congratulate you. I well deserved. Next time, Manager of the Year. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ellie. And we have several people on, uh, uh, our hybrid access, and the first one is G. Foley.
Are you there? Are you on Hi, mute? this is Killian Foley, 432 Sterling Place. Good evening, Council, and thank you for allowing me to share my thoughts about several matters relevant to tonight's meeting. Um, I'd like to share some objections that I have. Uh, objection one is I object to the motives for hiring a historic preservation consultant. Motives, as I understand it to be, as an attempt to find loopholes in the historic designation of Shedler to get what you want. I'm becoming of uh, those I consider upstanding citizens of this community. Two, if the prospective historic preservation consultant is present tonight, I object to his presence. Three, I object to any plans that will wipe out an entire ecosystem that currently exists and thrives on the Shedler property. Four, I object to any further planning and action taken on the Shedler property without top priority placed on the quality of life of our, of our residents who live in the proximity of that property. People must always come first. And finally, I passionately implore more than one council member to be courageous. Fall on the sword, like many great leaders must do at times, and simply change your mind. No apology is needed. Think quality of life, think community, and by golly, think green. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Foley. Next, next up is Ankit Daria. Ankit? Ankit, are you there? Oh, you're on mute. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, right, right. Good evening, everyone. This is Ankit Daria, uh, 471 West Saddle River Road. I want to start off by saying that we are all part of the village of Ridgewood. Everyone should, their uh, voice and concerns should be assessed as we have the right to know what's going on. We have spent years to work on the previous plan, which the neighborhood and the ad hoc committee that was formed by the previous council. They all work diligently on it. You're now back to making changes, which will cost us more, and it's gonna delay the project even longer, not knowing if it's ever gonna be completed. I've heard from other members or other people on the west side of Ridgewood that uh, there were plans for the Gordon Park a while back. That never happened. I don't want something like that to happen to Shedler. We have a plan in place, let's get it done. So I urge the council to take all the precautions for the safety of the neighborhood, the people living around it. And I urge you all to look at the aspects that could endanger, endanger not only the animals around, but also the people, the people with the wells, and uh, before making your final decision. We wanna work with everyone and not against anyone. Thank you. Thank you, Ankit. Next up is Leo Ruane. And Leo, you're on mute. There we go. Uh, hi, good evening. Leo Ruan, 705 Kingsbridge Lane. Uh, I would like to uh, talk to council and remind them that the community of uh, people near Shedler support a small, uh, small field. That is what we compromised for. But I um, want to talk about encroachment tonight. Uh, the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection Rules, Chapter 4, regarding the New Jersey Register of Historic Places, Rules in Section 7-4, the state outlines the criteria for what is encroachment on a historic property. This includes physical destruction of part of the registered property, alteration of the character of the property settings, introduction of visual, audible, or atmospheric elements that are out of character with the property. This definition fits squarely into the plans for Schmettler. The property is being destroyed without appropriate archaeological studies. The large turf field design will alter the character of the property visually and audibly by placing artificial fields 
within yards of the historic property, like requiring netting, possibly introducing lighting and sound systems. Uh, this plan is completely out of character with the property and, and changes it simply into just another sports complex. No peaceful enjoyment of the property by the community. No walking paths. No integrity left for the historic home. The council should adhere to the rules of the state pursuant to which SHPO is mandated to review Ridgewood's plans and respect the character of this historic property. Thank you. I yield my time. Thank you, Leo. Next up is Lori Weber. Good evening, Lori. Lori, you're on mute. Thank you. Okay. Here I am. Hear me now? Perfect. Okay. Lori Weber, 235 South Irving Street. I thought I'd give it a go from home because it seems that people in the room, there are always too many that don't get a chance to speak. And or actually, as someone who's speaking from home, I think the people who show up should get deference, just like they do at the uh, Board of Education. Uh, that being said, um, I want to mention something that I've mentioned at a previous meeting. You have people in the room there. Three or four of them spoke to you directly about the possibility of well water contamination on their properties by a turf field that would to, that would is proposed to be installed in their neighborhood. And you know we're a village that who's having a PFAS crisis here when it comes to water. And I want to urge those people to do their homework. And if that is the case, you have been put on notice and you need to file an injunction to stop this. And I say that because the courts don't like people who wait and it, you lose credibility in front of a judge if you sit and wait to see what this, this council will do. You've been put on notice, Get your, do your homework. If you're going to be contaminated, you, need, you can go to court and stop this. And I think that you should. Um, I also want to take an opportunity to recognize Heather Maylander, uh, to congratulate her for a job well done and for being named uh, Clerk of the Year. Great going, I'm not surprised. And, um, and that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lori. Next up is Olivia Sakakihara. Hello, um, I'm Olivia. Uh, I'm homeowner and resident at 172 West Glen Avenue. And the reason I'm calling today is because we learned that the project to uh, extend the sidewalks uh, in the stretch of West Glen where we live um, is about to be canceled or shelved. And I would like to highlight that in this very stretch uh, live several children and they, they cannot uh, enjoy the advantage of walking to school as other kids do. And also there are several individuals with um, disabilities of, or special needs living in this area. So I uh, would like to ask uh, this council to reconsider, to like go back to our project and um, set priorities straight, I would say, because this is a matter of safety. And finally, Ridgewood prides itself from being a walkable city and we, we cannot say as much and we are in a kind of a dangerous uh, stretch of Glen. Thank you for your attention and please um, reconsider. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. We have a couple of minutes left and there was one lady who was waiting patiently, was next in line. If you'd like, we can get you in. Sure. Hi, 
I'm Niti Mystery 416 Colwell Court. I'm sorry, I'm a little all over the place. I'm sorry, what was your name? Niti Mystery Thank 416 you. Colwell Court. So I'm here to request the Glen Avenue sidewalks to be put back in the budget as high priority item and to remove items that don't pertain to safety. But I wanted to point out something about Shedler first. I do care about the turf. I don't live anywhere near Shedler, but I keep hearing about it and I'm concerned about it because I'm concerned for our neighbors. Um, I want to know who wants it and why. Um, I remembered something today. Siobhan, I remember when you were a um, candidate and you were, um, I remember getting a flyer from you in the mail. And I remember your flyer said something to the effect of, I'm only sending you one flyer because I care so much about the environment. And I have really appreciated that because I can't stand clutter in my mailbox. And I thought that was great. Um, but I also want to point out that environmentalists um, do, not support tur uh, do not support turf. So remember that when you have to vote for turf and please oppose the turf. Um, also, I'd like you to honor the scope of the project that was agreed upon. <coughs> Um, and the reason, I, I care about that because I care about the neighbors, but I also care because the bigger that project gets, it eclipses other projects in town, like the West Glen project, which centers around safety. So you can make everyone happy by sticking to the original scope of project, keeping it with the grass field, taking that money, putting it back into safety, putting it back into the West Glen sidewalks, fixing the footbridge, um, dealing with the stormwater, giving our trees, you can, you have the opportunity to really make everyone happy if you get creative, you can do it. Um, sorry, I was like still scribbling, so I'm a little all over the place, but one other thing I wanted to mention, my son, who's 16, he's a junior, he pointed something out, he's a new driver, he has a permit, and we were driving down West Glen, and he says, you know, Mom, uh, the reason people speed is because there's no sidewalks. When there are no sidewalks, it takes away that feel that residential feel. And as soon as you see sidewalks, you naturally slow down. So he said, I think if they put in the sidewalks, people would drive better. They wouldn't speed as much and people would have that access. So again, um, I believe projects centering safety are simply just more important and should be the logical priority. And I think most people would agree. So please um, stick with the smaller Shedler project. Don't push through turf because nobody wants that. And um, put the, the Glen sidewalks back in the budget, please. Thank you. Thank you, Nidhi, and thank you, everyone, for your thoughtful comments tonight. I'm especially grateful that uh, the people online allowed um, Linda Scarpa in so that she could jump in. Uh, I thought that was a wonderful piece of neighborliness. And so, on to the rest of our agenda. Okay, the next one is manager's report. Uh, council chat is the first Saturday of every month. The next council chat is scheduled for Saturday, May 6th from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. right here in the courtroom. Please call for reservations, 201-670-5500, extension 2207. Walk-ins are welcome, however, reservations have priority. The Ridgewood Chamber of Commerce presents Easter in the Park at Memorial Park at Van Ness Square on Saturday, April 8th from 11 a.m. till 2 p.m. This is weather permitting. Um, there will be an Easter egg hunt from 11 to 11.15 a.m. At 11.15 a.m., the Easter Bunny arrives for photos, tables with games and fun, chalk and walk in the front of the park, and music by School of Rock from Waldwick will be there, as well as uh, Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Um, all village departments will be closed on Friday, April 7th, in observance of the Good Friday holiday. There will be no garbage and recycling pickup on that day. The recycling center will also be closed. Please check your um, garbage and recycling pickup for this week because it has changed due to the holiday. Yard waste collection begins on Monday, April 10th. Please check the village calendar for your collection area. The health department will be hosting an educational program on Tuesday, April 18th from 1 to 2 p.m. at the Public Library Auditorium. The subject is, what exactly is a care manager? Um, Tiffany Ewell, a care manager, will present what care managers do, how they do it, why it is beneficial, and how to pay for one. Light refreshments will be provided. Please call the Ridgewood Health Department for a, uh, to register, 201-670-5500, extension 2313 or 2312. Online registration for Graydon Pool and Tennis Pickleball um, began on April 1st. 
Um, sign up through community pass, ridgewoodnj.net slash community pass. Visa or MasterCard is accepted and a 3% convenience fee will be charged. Um, early bird registration for Graydon Pool is through April 30th. Savings on Ridgewood resident adult and children's badges is $14 savings on each of those. Uh, the discount does not apply to Ridgewood um, resident senior badges. Um, summer day camp is actually full, believe it or not. They quickly filled up um, over the weekend. No further registrations will be accepted at this time. Uh, 2023 grading season, families may now purchase a babysitter badge for $195. This can be used by uh, live-in nannies, au pairs, uh, multiple daily babysitters over the age of 18, or grandparents. Please note that those in possession of this special badge may not enter the facility unless they are accompanied by the child badge holder, and they are also not permitted to bring guests during any visits to the pool. The RBSA opening day parade will take place on Saturday, April 22nd. The parade will begin at 9 a.m. at the Ridgewood train station, continue down Ridgewood Avenue to Maple Avenue, and end at Veterans Field, where there will be food trucks, vendors, and fun for the whole family. Uh, the Village's annual Earth Day and Daffodil Festival will be held on April 23rd from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. It's being held in Memorial Park in Venice Square. The family-friendly event will feature a petting zoo, eco-friendly kids' crafts, games, and live music. Um, also, Ridgewood Water will present Journey from Rain to Drain via displays and printed material. Um, also, I know that there's a Daffy Dog Parade for um, dogs that are dressed up as well as their owners. Um, reminder, the two day per week irrigation is in effect. So if you have an odd number to dress, you may irrigate on Tuesday and Saturday. And even numbered addresses are Wednesday and Sunday. There is no irrigation on Monday, Thursday, and Friday. Village Council upcoming meetings are broadcast live on the Village website and Channel 34 on Fios also available on Zoom or by phone and YouTube. April 12th is our regular public meeting. April 26th um, is the Village Council work session. And then April 27th is the budget adoption hearing and vote on the budget. Those all begin at 7.30 p.m. That's all I have. Thank you, Heather. Council reports, Siobhan? So on March 23rd, we met with the Board of Ed to talk about how to move forward on three issues, flooding, parks and recreation, and fields. It was a very good meeting, and I'm very grateful to the Board of Ed for their time. On March 25th, there were two events that I attended. The first was uh, the dock walk at the Duck Pond in honor of Shiraz Iqbal. Um, Shiraz Iqbal was a, a local local kid who grew up here. He was also my pediatrician to my two kids. Um, it was a lovely event. It was incredibly well attended, and I wanted to thank Heather and Matt for helping with the proclamation that March 25th was Shiraz Iqbal Day. Um, that evening, we also, most of the council attended a lovely event downstairs where we celebrated Iftar, which was delicious and informative and a really great event, and um, congratulations to everybody who put it together. Um, I think we're going to be upstaged as a village next year. They've been offered a different venue, um, but it was very exciting to be around. On March 28th, we had our Parks and Recreation meeting, um, and the conversation ranged across all things parks, um, a large discussion of Shedler, the Master Library, which is still on schedule to be rolled out in August, um, hopefully in time for fall sports. Um, we highlighted what Heather mentioned already, that April 1st badges go on sale at Graydon, which is great. And the most important thing is that last year they received a lot of feedback about the babysitter badge, and they have adjusted and issued that. So when you see the announcements for the badges, this babysitter badge is new this year, and it's in response to you know people who have third parties coming in to care for their kids, and they're unable to go because the kids are minors and can't sign them in as guests. Um, we are still looking for lifeguards, so if anyone has a lifeguard in their family who's looking for employment, it plays very well. Um, they're doing well with the recruitment, but last year we had a serious lifeguard shortage in America, and Ridgewood also had that. 
And then the last part of the discussion was centered around adult play again. Um, we've had some over 50 leagues show up and they are clamoring for space the same way. Apparently, they're very good and they want to play and they need time um, and they're trying to get worked into the schedule and potentially get adopted by one of the organizations that sponsors the youth teams. On um, April 1st, I had a lovely council chat with Councilwoman Reynolds. We met with three people, and the discussion ranged from leaf blowers to a Girl Scout who was looking for inspiration for her gold award. Um, it was lovely to have a one-on-one, -on -one, and I wanted to remind everybody that the first of the month, two of us partner up, and we you know, meet with the public, and you can call the clerk's office and make a reservation, but it was really nice to have that one-on-one. -on -one. And then yesterday, um, Paul and I met with the American Legion and we did the interviews for Bur Boys and Girls State. And again, it was a complete treat to interview six local students, uh, five from Ridgewood High School and one from Wyckoff. Um, our kids are amazing, their ideas are wonderful, and the interviews were a total treat. And I want to thank the American Legion for including us. It's centered largely around uh, civic participation and what they hope to get out of this program. Two other things I wanted to mention is that um, May is Older Americans Month and the kids are running again Toiletry Tuesday through the high school. So if anybody has any interest of this, the high school is running. It collects basic needs and essentials for Ridgecrest Senior Housing. And then just in response to the public comment, uh, Lorraine also has this. While we were talking um, about the sidewalks, I did want to say two things. I did pull the past amount of money that the village has spent on West Glen, and it's just shy of $100,000. The ask this year was a million dollars, which is tenfold. So I forwarded that to Lorraine simply, one, I can't forward it to everybody else, and she is the citizen safety. So the ask this year was 10 times. It went from $100,000 to a million dollars. And on that, Heather's been having some serious email problems, so I figured to say it here. The engineers are going back at, not at my direction, but looking at what was the contributor to the million. You know, could they get a million lower? Um, the project, as far as I see it, hasn't been canceled. It's a cost issue, but I did just want to let everybody know that, that we're pulling the numbers. You know, being new here, I wanted to look into it. The million dollar ask was too high for this year, and I think the engineering department, Heather, because of the emails, is looking at possibly removing some retaining walls and getting the million dollar ask a little bit lower so that project can continue at a future date. That's it. Thank you, Siobhan. Evan? Great. Thanks so much. Just two things I really wanted to cover, uh, somewhat quickly. First, uh, library uh, rolled out their new website. It's really, really well done. It's ADA compliant. The best part is it didn't cost us anything. They got a grant for it, so it's fantastic for the library. But I urge all of you to go visit the new, uh, uh, new uh, website up that the library has. Um, also, April 15th at the library is the second annual repair clinic. Um, if you've got small electrical devices, they will have experts there help you fix it so that way you can save stuff instead of putting it into a landfill. Um, I did also want to just take a moment and recognize the IFTAR celebration that Siobhan had mentioned before. Um, a bunch of us were invited to that here in Village Hall about a week and a half ago, and it was amongst the highlights um, of my time so far in the council. Um, it was warm, it was welcoming, uh, the generosity was flowing, uh, there was a huge turnout from the community as well as from our officials. And it sort of struck me because this past weekend I went to an event at Temple Israel where there was a British Jew talking about growing up Jewish in, in Europe and how their minorities have to hide um, their religion. And he talked specifically about during Hanukkah having to light a menorah, but unlike what we do here in the United States, they would keep it in their kitchen so that the neighbors could not see it. Um, and they would hide their identities and that. That was very common, not just amongst Jews in Europe for a long time, but also Muslims and other minorities. And as I was listening to him speak, I, I thought back to the Iftar celebration where it was literally at Village Hall, the seat of, you know, of our community, uh, four out of the five of us were there. Mayor spoke, deputy mayor was there. Uh, state assemblymen showed up, state senators showed up. Uh, our congressman sent a, a representative to speak to it. And I thought what an amazing place that we all are so fortunate to live in. That, you know, whereas in other places, you know, people have to hide their differences and uh, here we celebrate them. Um, it was really remarkable. Um, got to bring my son, who got to see it. My wife and daughter, unfortunately, were unavailable, but got to introduce my son to his Muslim neighbors and he got to try hummus and all sorts of other great foods. And again, the generosity was just overflowing and really just, just a, a high point so far. So I want to thank the, the Muslim community here for making that available to all of us in the community. And I very much look forward to Iftar again, uh, another Iftar dinner again next year. Thanks, Evan. Lorraine? Thank you. Um, the Cash Off Shell Committee will meet this Wednesday. They're celebrating 60 years of the Cash Off Shell. 
and for the first time ever, they're asking for donations. Their website is www.cashawmemorialshell.com. They'll take any donation you're willing to give if you've enjoyed these concerts in the parks for the last 10, 20, 30, 60 years. I suggest, you know, maybe give a donation. It would be nice. Uh, the Project Pride Committee will be meeting on Monday, April 10th. Our planting day in the Central Business District is scheduled for Sunday, May 21st. If you have any interest in helping plant the pots down in the Central Business District, please email me at lreynolds at ridgewoodnj.net to sign up for help. It's a very small commitment. Last year, I think we were done two hours beginning to end. You know, the more people we get, the shorter time it would be. Longest commitment would be three hours. April 20th will be the next CSAC meeting. We recently got a flyer about um, something Ridgewood did last year. It's called Learn and Ride. Safe Bike Skills course, and it's going to be on Saturday, May 13th. This is, I, I mean, it was a huge hit last year. I wish it was around when my kids were learning. So there's two different types of sessions. The first one is kids that are gonna learn to ride. That's for ages five and up. They use a balance first approach, so no pedals. And then the second type of course is going to be the safe bike skills that teaches basic skills to safety or in safety to ride your bikes. That course is for third through 11th grade. The children will learn and practice skills with a fun and safe course. This will occur at the Graydon Pool parking lot and the cost is $15. Registration is through Community Pass. The instruction is by Easy Rides Bike Safety Team in conjunction with Ridgewood's Parks and Recs Department and Ridgewood Police Department. Um, so that's it. I do want to make a comment on what Siobhan said about the West Glen sidewalks. She did send me an email that um, Chris had said they were working on something, maybe not with retaining walls because the retaining walls are what costs so much. So I would love it. I don't know, Heather, are we allowed to ask Chris, you know, when the time is right tonight, can Chris come up and just tell us what his thoughts are? And then the other question I would have, since the entire million was taken out of the budget, if they do find a way that they could do the sidewalks this year, how can we get the money? So those are those two questions. And then I just want to say, 38 years ago tonight, my husband and I went on our first date. And we never looked back. Happy anniversary, honey. I love you. And see you later. <laughs>
not you, you go to the mayor's one. Um, any of you can attend. Uh, and let's see, the green team still has one opening. Green team handles our certification with Sustainable Jersey. They also work very closely with Green Ridgewood and it's a great group and they're very active. Um, there's going to be a joint meeting of the Open Space Committee and the um, Parks and Recreation Board that is open to the public. It's going to be here in late April. I don't want to use my phone on the dais, but um, <laughs> it's the last Tuesday in April, I believe. It's here in the Youth Lounge in, uh, at 7.30 in the evening, and that's all I have. Thanks, Pam. Um, I have two reports from the uh, Community Center Advisory Board and Stigma Free Committee, which are two of my favorite committees, and I'm going to hold those until our next meeting because I neglected to bring my notes with me, so please forgive me. Um, I, 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 they deserve better than my forgetfulness. But, um, but I will say that um, I did participate in the American Legion Boys and Girls State interviews with Siobhan um, on Sunday, which I have to tell you, if these are the people that we're handing our society to, they're going to take good care of us. Um, these are outstanding young men and women. I mean, absolutely outstanding. I was incredibly impressed with them. And I, want to th I also want to thank the American Legion for fostering um, their uh, progression. Um, I also did attend um, the Westfield Review uh, uh, last week with uh, Pam. And I, I have to tell you, we can all learn so much by talking to other communities, some of whom have made the same mistakes and learned by them, and some of whom have been innovative that we can follow. And so that was great. But I have to tell you, the, the highlight of the year so far was attending the IFTAR um, uh, right in this building. And as, as Evan pointed out, right in this building. It was wonderful. And um, I always say that you get to really know people when you break bread with them. And putting aside that their food was outstanding, um, this is just a, a wonderful, wonderful event. The police chief was there, the fire chief was there. I mean, there, it was, it was a, a wonderful event. Um, I have been to many iftars. Um, I was at another one at the Midland Park Mosque um, this past weekend. Um, I urge all of you, if you have an opportunity to attend an iftar and you're not sure, go. You will be greeted with open arms, warmly. They're so happy to see people. This is not a, it is a Muslim event, but it is an open house to everyone in the neighborhood. And they are so happy when someone from outside their community comes. So again, I urge you all to attend whenever possible. And that ends our council reports, and we will now get on to our regular agenda. Okay, so we have presentations. The first one is a donation um, called Linda's Grove. So I'll have the um, individuals come up now and explain what that is. Just make sure the button is pushed and the green light is on. And just identify yourself, please. Okay. Thank okay. you. I would like to thank you very much for inviting us here this evening. Uh, my name is Jean Boyle, 106 North Pleasant Avenue. I'm representative from a group um, called Friends of Linda McNamara. And I come here this evening to update you uh, regarding uh, a memorial that is, has been designed for Linda. Um, which is going to be, is in fact, in back of the, the stable. Linda McNamara passed away uh, this past July. Without a doubt, this extraordinary woman left footprints in the hearts of those of us who were personally touched by authentic kindness and generosity of spirit. But she has left a lasting imprint on the entire Ridgewick community as well. 
Linda was tireless in her support for a first-rate education for special needs children, in her sensitivity to the importance of meeting the growing needs of Ridgewood seniors, in her activism for the humane treatment of defenseless animals, and in her genuine love for the preservation of our um, shared environment. She took the opportunity to promote these and many um, other significant matters formally and informally at the Board of Education meetings, village council meetings, numerous civic events, and neighborhood gather gatherings. Due to her many contributions to the betterment of this town and its citizens, we thought it fitting that a memorial be established in the village in lasting memory to one of its true friends. Our goal is to establish Linda's Grove, a peaceful area containing a bench and trees and greenery where one can rest and quietly enjoy the surrounding beauty. Initially, our vision was very, very small. <laughs> and um, as we began to network, uh, so many people were excited and delighted and happy to participate. And we were blessed um, and very deeply appreciative of all the help that we've gotten from the village to bring forward this grove. We've had many earthly angels and without whom this would have been a challenge. Many helping us knew or knew of Linda. Nancy Bigos, Director of Parks and Recreation has been outstanding. I cannot say enough wonderful things about her help. Without her guidance, we would have encountered many roadblocks each time she cleared the path. And we consider her a member of our committee. Her staff, Dina and Matt of Shade Tree, have really been willing and more than helpful. The village manager has supported us, and Chris Ramundi has donated the landscape plans and is supervising the installation of the trees and plantings which the village will plant. A lot of coordination and time has been given by each, all because they knew or knew of this good woman who touched so many along her life journey. What a testimony of love, love of the community for a woman who has loved us. I think we have passed. Oh, they're out, okay. I think that probably what's most of interest to you is page nine. Okay, which is in fact Jean, designed. if you could speak into the microphone, sir. Okay. What is probably of most you. interest to you is page nine, which is the landscape design, which Chris has uh, designed for uh, the site. And if you were to look at it, um, you may come to realize that, in fact, there are uh, over nine trees to be planted, in addition to a bench and various shrubs, three cherry trees, three dogwoods, three red buds. There'll be a number of viburnums, which will have a beautiful scent to the area. Um, there will be uh, rhododendrons, um, two, uh, three cherry trees, I think I mentioned. So a total of nine trees. Uh, additionally, there will be some ground cover, some vinca. <clears throat> there will be some uh, Lenten rose will be planted, uh, and uh, along with some, uh, some, vern, uh, some fern. There also will be some Andromeda. Uh, the desire was to really keep the area in a natural state, to reflect, really to clean it up, it's almost like a grove within a much larger grove. So there'll be a very beautiful flowering uh, trees um, and uh, some you know, various other plantings which will flower, uh, some which will not. Um, but it will be a lovely area. And if you look at page, continue on to look at page 10 and page 11, you, know, you can see that the um, bench is currently in place. It's a magnificent view from the bench. You're facing the brook and the bridge, um, and you hear, you can hear, you know, the quiet ripple, you know, of water. It's very serene, unless there's a baseball game, then perhaps it will not be so serene. But it's a really a, a quite a beautiful sight. It was in need of some cleanup, so I think that, you know, that is right now it has been done, uh, and the planting will um, now take place um, around the end of April is when the plantings will, will go in. 
Um, additionally, if you go to the last page, you should see the uh, stone um, and you should see uh, the plaque that has been just placed. The stone and, and uh, the bench actually came in place about in the last week. I would like to take the opportunity, and I hope you can hear me very clearly on this, to thank the village and the village manager, Heather Maylander, to thank Nancy Bigos, Director of Parks and Recreation, to thank Chris Raimondi for his beautiful work, which he donated to us, to Dina Katz of Parks, Matt Andrew, who's a supervisor of Parks, and his staff members, particularly Josh Osborne, and John Quinn. Last week, they made a little miracle for us. So particularly grateful to them. And I'd have to remember Mary Hefferman of the stable staff. Um, I'd be happy to entertain any questions that you have. Um, a lot of the photos before are the before site photos and in process. And then you can see where we're at right now today. If there are no questions, I would uh, like to extend an invitation to you each to join us on May 17th at 1 p.m. at the stable for the dedication of Linda's Grove. We really hope that you all can join us. And again, we thank you for your generosity, um, for having a remarkable staff. We never would have been able to be where you are right now, you know, really without all the help so generously given. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, questions? I just, I just have a few comments. Thank you, Jean. Um, Linda would be so humbled by this. I mean, she was such a humble person. She would be amazed. And I really think it's a wonderful thing that you and your friends and all of Linda's friends have done. This is so beautiful. I can't wait to see it. And uh, I hope Will her children be able to be there at the dedication, or at least some of them, I hope? <laughs> well, I know they're far and wide. Um, but also, what, I just have a quick question. Is there, I assume since behind the stable, there's access to water? <laughs> yes, actually, we're, I think everywhere that you look is access to water in that area. Um, we actually are in, uh, actually it's a great location, not only um, in terms of its beauty, but in terms of that there's a natural runoff. It's okay. actually slightly mounded. So I, the pictures don't demonstrate that. Um, so I just went there last week after the rains, and I was very happy to see. There was an, almost a natural runoff okay. that has developed over years. Okay. So when the plantings were, uh, were, are primarily located, which is a distance from the brook, okay, uh, it, it, in that particular area. Um, it, it the design was thought of in mind of the concern for water, okay. a concern for not full sun, concern for keeping you know, the natural uh, look of the, of, of the area. So that, those were some of the considerations, and that's where Chris was so very helpful and knowledgeable. Um, you know, he's just, he's remarkable. He, uh, he's yeah. great. So we're very excited to see what's going to happen the, the okay. end, of, end of April. Thank you so much. I really appreciate everything you guys More did. More than welcome. It's beautiful. As much as I miss Linda, I'm so glad to see this coming to fruition. Thank you. I think that what has been, um, and I'm speaking for myself, but I should mention that Janet Anderson is here from the committee. And, and uh, Burton Walsh is here. Um, Gail Sussman is not here. She's a member, um, you know, along with Helena Moselard and Patty Infantino. And of course, I consider Nancy Bigos a member of our committee. <laughs> um, but uh, we have been very, um, it's been very heartwarming to see the amount of response. You know, we had a vision of uh, a bench and maybe two trees, you know, and then the donations came in and so many people wanted to be part of it, you know, so, so we're looking forward to uh, May 17th. Um, we'll hopefully get publicity out. Everyone is welcome. You know, all you have to do is love Linda and we want you to be there. So we're really excited. 
very grateful. I, I can't think of a more beautiful spot to have in her honor. I really can't. We looked at about nine spots, I think, that Nancy had for us. And I saw this one, I said, hmm, this is very interesting. And we all walked in and looked at it in its worst shape and in the worst weather, but we could still see that we had a vision for it, and I think it's gonna to come to fruition. So we're very grateful to you all. Anyone else? I just wanted to say thank you so much, and I too know she would love it. I was wondering if there's a way I could get this presentation so I could share it with the members of the Parks and Recreation Committee. Excuse me, I'm not hearing you. It, I was wondering if I could get a copy of this to cycle through both Shade Tree and the Parks and Recreation Committee because they love Linda, they'd love to be there, and it's so well done. Oh, it's so, our intention that. <coughs> yeah, so if, we could, if you could send it to us, that, that would be great because I know a lot of people want to be there to honor her on the 17th. Well, we will make an effort to um, to get it out as to the general public and to, to everyone. And particularly, wanted to you know mention it. You will be getting the invitations will be going out, you know, and we'll hopefully get patched into something. And Jean, um, working with Nancy, I am absolutely certain um, that this is going to be a wonderful project. She is. I've worked with her on many projects, and and your stated appreciation for her is something that we all understand and we are grateful to have her and her team. What a great team she's got. I have to say that what I think is particularly remarkable is the excellent communication within her team. I, and I've worked with other groups and I have to say I deeply appreciate um, her help, uh, her emails on the weekend. <laughs> I mean, she's really uh, been really a gift to us. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jean. You're very welcome. Okay, our next presentation is on the Shedler property update. Uh, Chris Redesauser, our village engineer, is here. Good evening, Chris. Uh, good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. Um, I think you have before you the latest and greatest uh, example of what we can do on the Shedler property. Uh, what we did is we oriented the field parallel with the berm. Uh, we're able to fit in a 4060 baseball diamond in the northwest corner, basically. Uh, the two f the fields. Are the, it's a lax field that is a 180, 195 feet wide. It's a 200 and a 210 foot soccer field, and it's 330 feet in length for the soccer and for the lax also. And Chris, I'm looking at this and I'm wondering. I don't know that we have it to put it up on screen. Yeah, we, we, we don't have it to put on screen. My apologies. I, I For anyone who's interested, I will show you my. I can share my copy. Yep. Why don't you, why don't you bring them both and then we'll, we'll, we'll look on together. And there are, there are two copies on the book? Oh, okay, there's copies on there. There's copies on the table, Susan. You can take you can take these copies that we're giving you. So they're not all the same. Note that there are two different ones there. There's actually three. Oh, three. Three different drawings. So Chris, um, as always, thank you so much for um, the tireless work you put into this, you and Yovan, I know, um, uh, for all the different drafts. I'm looking at this latest um, uh, rendition, and I have a couple questions. Um, can the baseball field, baseball softball field, the 4060 diamond, be superimposed upon the utility field, the multipurpose field, the same way it, it was in the one uh, that is that has the multi-purpose field parallel to Saddle River Road. 
Paul, could you just give the map number that you're referring to number? for the record? Sure. Um, well, it's like 8A here. or 8B. The first one you were referring to is 22C. Got it. Thank you. That's what I'm looking for. Yes. 22C. Thank you so much. 22C has the 4060 diamond um, partially outside of the uh, multipurpose field. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I was just here. Here's the number. Oh, okay. okay. Do you have it, Siobhan? Yeah. Lower right hand corner. Yes, yeah, sorry for the confusion. Hmm. And, this one. Oh, and the, so, uh, this get that? Yeah, on the right. Yeah, we have found this. I don't think I have. Oh, there it is. There okay. it, was, it was the last one. I think we yep. got today. All right. So, the um, concept 22C has the 4060 diamond partially outside the multi purpose field, um, whereas Concept 24 has it completely or virtually completely self-contained in the multipurpose field. Um, in, in 22C that has the multipurpose field parallel to the berm, could that baseball diamond be superimposed on the multipurpose field as it was in Concept 24? Uh, where would you, <coughs> excuse me, where would you want the home plate orientation to be? If it was in the lower right-hand corner. Um, we can take a look at that, but right now on, the, on 22C in the lower right-hand corner, we're proposing the playground and the bathrooms. With no, the not, not where, the, where the playground is. In the lower right-hand corner of the multipurpose field, as it is in Concept 24, so that it's completely self-contained on the multipurpose field, so it doesn't take up any more space. Uh, we we can take a look at that. Um, we'll see how it looks. Got it. For those of you who are looking on, um, the concept number is in the is in the lower right-hand corner of the. Drawing, which says Zabriskie Shedler property park redevelopment plan, park development plan concept. So that's what I'm referring to. So, does anybody have it? Uh, oh, any questions about any of these drawings? Yes. On 22C, um, is there no, have we gotten rid of the parking lot? The yes, larger parking at this lot? time. At this time, we have not situated the park lot because our intent was to provide as much separation from the playing fields to the house. Where does um, what's your view on parking then? Because that, that's a problem. I mean, I'm just trying to figure out. I mean, are, where was everybody going to park then? We lose uh, the uh, parking lot. That is going to be a question that uh, I'll look for guidance from the council. We can put parking in the very southern triangle. Again, that's currently uh, shaded to indicate mm -hmm. a tree area to remain. Um, that's about the only other location on the site that we could put parking. And if we did put parking there, the walk for the users of that lot to the field would be a couple hundred feet. And I know we had asked this before, but um, how many spots are we adding around the side of the field? Well, we have seven in the small lot directly west of the house. That's the shaded brown. And then we propose approximately 18 spaces, oh, gotcha. parallel spaces along Saddle River Road. And that's the only parking yeah, that this drawing shows in this configuration. So about 25 spots without the, without the lot. Yes. And then presumably whoever else has to then park on the street somewhere else. It would have to park on the street or... Again, we'd have to look at where else on the campus or, the, or on the site uh, we can put a parking lot. Right. And there'd be no, there, there's no, on 22C, there's no even small lot for the house, right? Excuse me? All the parking for the house, too, would have to be along the street as well, right? Yes. Well, you have the. Oh, no, I'm sorry. There is, that, is, that is a small no. lot for the you house. You have the seven space small lot, gotcha. two ADA accessible spaces, five conventional spaces, and that's the one that's immediately west of the house. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Well, I'm looking at this, and I don't know that we, we are in a position at this point to sacrifice the parking. Um, I think it's a critical part of the 
whole plan. So um, while uh, it's good that we got a view of what it would look like um, with the field parallel to the berm, um, I would endorse staying with concept 24. Paul, just out of curiosity, what you're, I'm, I'm looking at that versus 1F, and I'm trying to decide, I mean, what, what makes you go with that one over 1F? I think the, I think that the, um, and I think the only distinction that I see is where home plate would be on the, on the 4060 diamond, and I think it is better suited and less obtrusive if it is in the lower right-hand corner as mm -hmm. opposed to the upper right-hand corner because there'll be fencing there. <coughs> um, so I think it's, it's in a better spot so as not to uh, uh, create a barrier in the middle of the park. All right. And we can't do an overlay with grass, right? Overlay requires turf. Excuse me? Oh, if we do an overlay of, of both a soccer field and a baseball field, it has to be turf, right? Um, it can be natural grass, but that's going to require a lot of marking, striping, and so forth. I'm not an expert on groundskeeping. I would defer to our parks department who would be responsible for that. Okay. Chris, in drawing these two that we're looking at right now, was where the player, baseball players would be facing, was that part of the reason why you put the baseball di diamond in one orientation versus another? Uh, we, we do consider if the batter is looking into the sun or if the players are looking into the sun. Um, but we've seen baseball fields with all manner of orientation. Anyone else? How many trees would we have to take out of the Arbavita, the Green Giants? Uh, how many would we have to take out? Yeah. From From where? the berm area. In the configuration you're looking at here for 22C, we don't anticipate any trees that were planted along the berm, top or base, would need to be impacted. Okay. Would the walkway have to be moved or... Like uh, the walkway the was indicating. The walkway, I believe, was shifted slightly. As you can see, the dash, the red dash line, mm. which is the run out limit line for the field, goes right against the walkway in the um, southwest corner of the field, roughly. But is that 22C you're talking about? Yes, on 22C. Okay, but I think we all are in agreement that there has to be a parking lot, so 22C, I, I, I don't know, are we saying that 22C doesn't work? I, I, I don't think 22C works. I think, right, I think, so tw I I think 24, and, and, it, and it's good to see it so that we could take a look to see if it worked, um, but I, I, I think that um, without a parking lot, um, uh, uh, that's a big problem. I so. think Pam was asking about concept 24. Yeah, I'm sorry. With You're the right. taking, taking away the trees on the berm and the, the walkway being moved. Can you explain that? that? Which uh, one? On 24, concept 24. Yeah, w 24, if I recall, I don't have a copy in front of me. We do have to Here, nudge into, sure. we do have to nudge into the berm and we will have to replant or transplant some of the arborvitaes or the green giants that we have planted. It looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, possibly eight. And then will the walkway be where the berm was in that area? We would have to push the walkway into the berm a bit. Okay. I mean, uh, my, my opinion is, as it always is, this is like fitting a, you know, size 16 body into a size 2 bathing suit. It doesn't belong. It's way too big for the area. You're, 
the the field is going to be right on top of the house it's going to be right on top of the street it's going to be right on top of the eastern border it's going to take away almost all of the trees it, it's just it's too much it doesn't fit and no matter how hard you try and i appreciate all these different plans you can't fit something on a piece of property this size like what fits on this is going back to the original plan which we haven't seen in months because nobody talks about it but that looked like it fit it had a small field it had a parking lot it had a playground there were trees around it felt you know more natural this this is just it's sad it, 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 look at the house look at the size of the house compared to the field it's it's a crime it, it's it's just terrible and I feel really bad for the neighborhood that we're even considering this it should not be there was a concept plan that was agreed upon by all parties the neighbors the parks department the sports department two council members they worked very hard and it was agreed upon and it should not be changed. Does anyone else have any comments? No lights, yes? Pardon? There's no lights, no conduits. At this time, we are not considering permanent lights nor the infrastructure to support it. Okay. So I think that we need to make some decisions. Um, about what we want to uh, approve on April 12th. And so I'm going to propose that we go with drawing number 24, concept number 24, and I'm going to break the next part into two parts because I know that there's a split of opinion. Um, is everyone, or excuse me, who's in favor of the larger field as opposed to the small. You can't, you can't vote, just do do discuss it, it okay? Hmm? You cannot vote, you can just discuss it. Okay. Um, Maybe just ask everybody their, their opinion. Everyone asks their, yeah, their opinion. It's, it's size of the field and whether or not you're in favor of turf. Mm -hmm. Evan? Yeah, no thanks. I, um, as I've mentioned before, I've really tried hard not to have an opinion on it because I wanted to listen to everyone and also I wanted to make sure that if I changed my mind, I wasn't on record one way or the other, so I could kind of go, um, you know, and do what I think is right. Um, I've listened very closely to some of the Shadler folks, um, Fretra, others who have just been eminently reasonable and decent and persuasive. Um, and it's given me a lot to think about. Uh, I listened to a lot of people on sports uh, teams as well, and I just listened to a, letter, a lot of just regular average people and just, you know, did my homework. I spent some time on that property, um, spent some time last weekend at Habernickel looking how that was developed. And um, listen, it's tough because there's no win-win. There's simply no way to make everybody happy here. There just isn't. Um, what we are asked for, I think, as a council is to really balance the needs of the village with really the wants and, and the needs of the Shedler residents. Um, a couple of issues that have been really, really important to me. The first, you know, on the history piece, candidly, I, I've not found this one particularly persuasive. Um, you know, it's not like the British crossed Route 17 from Shedler on their way to the Paramus Church. Um, you know, that property has already been developed a long time ago. From what I've seen, it's been dug out of the ground. You could probably find that anywhere or in this area. Um, you know, I think it's important to respect the past, equally important to respect and plan for the future. Um, I don't think the brave men and women that fought in the revolution would want that property sitting fallow when kids need it. Um, I think we've also spent a tremendous amount of money on that house, and I think that has really been the nod to history there. And I look forward to seeing what we can do in the house, but candidly, the history argument is not something that's really, I think, resonated with me um, as much as maybe with others. The safety argument, though, on the other hand, has. And that's given me a lot to think about. Um, 
you know, I've done a fair amount of my own research on the turf, and while there is evidence out there, it is largely inconclusive. Um, we every day allow our kids to play at the high school. We allow our kids to play at Maple Field. Um, nobody's saying we should be tearing up turf. Um, there are certain municipalities that have, you know, taken a position on it. The vast majority of municipalities in this country have not taken a position on it. Um, and I, it's not, and at this point, I just don't find it that conclusive. Um, I will note, though, when we talk about safety, you know, we all talk about our kids will be on that field. I want to be very clear with my Shedler friends. When I say that, I'm not speaking figuratively. I'm speaking literally. There will be at least one jersey on this field with my last name on it. Um, so when I heard um, the doctor speak um, quite a bit about injuries on turf, candidly, I, every weekend we're at a turf field. Um, I found quite the opposite. You know, when you play, you know, we were just at a Habernickel last weekend right after it rained. The field was muddy. Kids were having trouble walking. Um, kids were having trouble because of the divots. Um, the turf fields are much safer. Um, you can use them all year round. Um, and again, in terms of the health evidence, I, I don't believe I'm wrong. I hope I'm not wrong. Certainly, if something changes, we can revisit. But until we're ready to rip up turf at all our other fields, it's not something that I found to be as meaningful as some, of some others. Um, and then when we talk about the need for fields, it's undeniable. Um, everybody with kids in this town knows we need more fields. Um, when we talk about health, there is nothing sadder than seeing a kid sitting at home on their phone because the fields got rained out. Um, that matters. That goes to depression, that goes to obesity, that goes to all sorts of things. Um, and I think we need to keep those people in mind. Um, especially, again, when you look at Habernickel, to me Habernickel is what this should be like. There are two fields there, it abuts the neighbors. Um, I think it's really nice. Um, when we talk about the history of what's happened here, you know, everybody says let's go back to the plan. Well, which plan? The 2009 plan, the 2015 plan, the 2017 plan, which called for a turf field, uh, but a smaller sized field. Um, I'm coming at it with new eyes and I'm going to make the call that I think is right here. Um, and for me, it's really about what is the most important thing for the village. You know, I think, as I said before, one thing I have expressed in the past that I stick by with was the village of Ridgewood spent the village's money to prevent this property from commercialization. But for the investment of Ridgewood residents, that would be a 7-Eleven right now. It would be a strip mall. It was absolutely the right thing to do. And we've done that for those folks in, in that neighborhood. And it was absolutely the right thing to do for those folks as well as the rest of the village. But with that, I think this, this property has to serve just as the needs of the neighbors, but also the needs of the entire village. And it is absolutely clear, once you get out of sort of the small uh, echo chamber that sometimes happens when you listen to the people that feel most, most, uh, most uh, feel are, are, are most closest to the issue, that we need something here that uh, fits the entire village. Um, I agree with Paul. I like this design. It's not perfect. I'm sure there'll be issues with it. But it gives us two fields. You can't use them both at once. It'll limit traffic. It gives us parking lot. It preserves a fair amount of, the tr of trees. Uh, it um, gives us the ability to maintain the house with its own separate area. There's a berm that separates it from the field. Um, it is the best of both worlds in an imperfect world. Um, and listen, I know it's good politics to kind of you know, speak to the folks that are here that feel strongly about it. But ultimately, what we have to do is, is make a decision for the entire village. And while I know this may cost me some votes next time I run, if I, if I decide to in this part of town, it may cost me, hopefully it won't cost me some friends in that area, I think it's the right thing to do. And, and I agree with the dual purpose, large turf field. I like this one as well, 24. I think it's the best one we've seen so far. Um, I'm interested to hear about now getting it through SHPO and trying to make sure that we get this down for next year so kids can be on this field. I'd urge my fellow councilmen to do the same. Thank you, Evan. Siobhan? Sure. So um, I've been thinking how to start this. First of all, um, I understand you have two decisions to make, but I want to remind everybody, we're, we're not just building a field, we're, we're building a park. And part of that discussion, in my opinion, has been lost. We have a massive asset of a $2.6 million house that is historical, it's there, and we need to come up with a future use. We're gonna need parking to support that house. And um, I went through my checklist, and. So much of the conversation has ended up on the field, and I think that's shortchanging the project overall because it was supposed to be a park with many different elements. So for me, I want this to be a park first, and I want to discuss with the house, and I've asked the neighbors, and I'm open to anything, what we should do with the house is a big deal for the neighborhood as well. What do we see the future use of the house being? 
I want to make sure that we have enough parking to support the house, the walking path, and the playground. So the walking path is, has been in every design, and that's to support people who want more passive recreation, you know, slower walking, observing. I think it's a great amenity. This field out here has constant use with the path. And then the playground. During this discussion, you know, as many of you know, my neighborhood has been missing a playground since 1980. And I think the sentiment from Woodside Park was always that our neighborhood would go there. And it's a beautiful thing to have a playground in your neighborhood. Um, with the Woodside Park neighborhood, we've welcomed more and more citizens and we have not increased any patch of greenery and we have not even restored the playground. So I want to make sure that any design includes both the walking path and the playgrounds. I think it's incredible that there's a public bathroom. Um, public bathrooms are vied for on fields. They're constantly noted. The pickleballers now have a portage on. It's a big discussion with sports, so that's excellent. And I also think that the lightning strike shelter is also amazing because those things will be great. In terms of the discussion, um, I tell this story all the time. In the conversation, I've had people say to me, I want it to be a buffer and a grove. And then when I talk to some of my sports friends, they're like, this is great. There's going to be a stadium. There's going to be music. There's going to be lights. And I'm like, OK, somewhere that's got to come into the middle. So I am not in favor of lights. I did want to say that the conduits were a good idea just because of the investment, but nobody wants to go with that, so I'm leaving it. No to the stadium, no to bleachers. I am going to say yes to turf because of the utilization, and we have a chronic demand for the turf that we have already. Older adults in our community do not want to play on the grass fields because they're overutilized and have safety issues. I also want to say that 2017, the recommendation was for the coconut filled turf. It's been turf since the beginning. Um, no to concession, no to music, and then changing, because I want to acknowledge this. My, my original campaign plan was to implement the 2017 plan. And when upon taking office, I'm on the flood mitigation thing. Flood mitigation is not looking very good for Ridgewood. We have five fields in the, the floodplain. We're doing things that we can do there. And I really feel that if we're going to build a field, we should go explore and go with the larger turf field. That's it. Thank you. Lorraine. Again, it's just too big for the property. I, the neighbors, their quality of life is going to be destroyed. I don't see how you guys have no empathy for their quality of life. The ecosystem, they, it's, it's going to be destroyed. Several of us here always talk about the environment. How can you destroy an entire ecosystem? It, it's just unbelievable to me that we can be considering this massive field. This is not a park, what I am looking at. I would like to have a park. Habernacle is beautiful. It has lots of open space. It has fields. It has a walking path. This has a walking path squeezed around the very perimeter where it's going to be so loud when you're walking around the back of it, you're going to be in harm's way from baseballs. The cars in the parking lot are going to be in harm's way from the baseballs. It's just too much. It needs to be more natural. There are so many trees that will be taken down. It, it's a crime. A and so many animals will be displaced. I, I just, I, you know, uh, that's all I can say. It's just, it is really sad that you guys don't seem to care about the quality of life in the neighborhood. It's, the neighbors, the five neighbors that have a well that are going to be drinking water running off this turf field, that, I, I mean, I hope they sue you. I really do. I, 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 it's, it's so horrible that you're even considering this. Thanks, Lorraine. Pam? There's enough literature out there on artificial turf because of the infill 
and because there's PFAS in it, that although it is not entirely conclusive, I can't sanction that on my watch. I don't want to find out in 20 years that our children um, are, are turning up with cancers and, and things like that. Um, I just don't think it's worth the risk. Yes, it is better to play on, you get more use out of it, I understand all that. The compromise that I'm willing to vote for is the larger field. I can see that the, the sports groups, the kids in our town, the most people, the most residents of our town will get the benefit out of this if we go for the larger field. But I think artificial turf could really turn out to be tragic. So, and not to mention that the disposal fees that we experienced with the maple field are in the tens of thousands. We don't have good luck with turf, not in the three fields that have it in Ridgewood. Um, I don't think it's a good gamble. That's all I have to say. Thanks, Pam. Um, I want to begin by saying thank you to all the impassioned people here who speak so clearly, so passionately, so respectfully on something that is incredibly important to them, that is very close to their home, and um, because that's the only way we go forward. So I want to begin by saying thank you. Um, I agree with Siobhan. I actually agree with pretty much everybody up here to, to some greater or lesser extent. It's tight fit clearly a tight fit. It's unavoidable. Um, we have a, we have, excuse me, we have a need for fields in this town. This is a, this is a, a school age community. There are about 15 communities within Ridgewood that share this responsibility. I have from the very beginning spoken of this shared responsibility. We all share it. And those of us who live near a field, that's the responsibility we share. Um, I am told, I was not here at the time, but I am told that uh, by our village manager that when this property was available for sale, that the community who lived nearby wanted this property and was less concerned about a field than they were about a 7-Eleven or a gas station. And so the village of Ridgewood, the entire village of Ridgewood, gave its tax dollars to purchase it and renovate it. It is not a private park. It is a park for the community, for everyone in the community. And as for whether or not the last plan was the original plan. It was not the original plan. It was only the latest plan. As we all know, a prior council voted for a different plan with a full-size baseball diamond that took out more trees. And the last council rescinded that. And this council is going in a different direction. <laughs> As for turf. I was told recently by one of Ridgewood High School's lacrosse coaches that it has been at least 15 years since the Ridgewood High School lacrosse team has played anywhere on anything but a turf field. They go up and down the East Coast. They go to different parts of, of the country. They only play on turf fields. Recently, Glen Rock installed a double turf field within the last year. As for the PFAS issue, which has become a lightning rod lately, um, we have PFAS everywhere. It's in this carpeting. It's in our food packaging. It's in our dental floss. It's in our clothing. It's everywhere. 
to pick out this one item and say we want to get rid of PFAS in this one item and yet leave it everywhere else in our homes, in our lives, in our clothing. That doesn't work for me. Um, we have PFAS and we have to deal with it and nobody wants it but no one is getting rid of their food packaging or their dental floss. So I am in favor of the full-size field. I am in favor of a turf field. And the reason that I'm in favor of the turf field is because it is the only way that we can fully utilize a field. Um, the problem with, with grass fields is that we don't have the Yankee Stadium grounds crew. And as a result, the injuries that come from a grass field are numerous. And they're numerous because what happens is the day after a rain or two days after a rain when the ground is soft, that and a team plays on it, it creates divots. Those divots harden like concrete. And the next team that plays on it is playing on a very uneven playing surface. We are not going to put lights in there. We're not going to put conduits in there. We are trying, as, as Evan said, to come up with the best of both worlds in an imperfect world. Baseball needs a full-size baseball diamond. We're not giving them that. We squeezed the baseball diamond, a smaller diamond, within the confines of the proposed multipurpose field. No one is getting everything they want, but everyone is getting something because this will be a park. This will be a beautiful park. It will have all of the same uh, attributes to it as it did before. The field will simply be larger. That's what I have. Okay, so we'll have a resolution for next week for this. Thank you, Heather. Okay. Um, our next item, if you could um, go to 9C2, nine, um, nine this way we can have um, Peter Primavera come up at this time and um, discuss with us his proposal. Can we make sure, Chris, can, we, can you come back at the next work session to talk about maybe the Glen Avenue sidewalks then and the retaining walls? Uh, what date would that be? Uh, probably, I think it's the, the 26th. 26th of April. Is that enough time? Is that okay with you? It's, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd love for him to say something tonight just to give some hope to the people of well, West Glen. And in this regard, if Chris came up with a workable plan on the 26th, Heather, mm -hmm. could that then be, could we update our um, capital budget? We, we would thing. do a new um, separate bond ordinance for it. Okay. Because okay. that would be the easiest way to go forward. And, and uh, I'll talk to you later about the other one. Great. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Primavera. Yes, sir. Welcome. Thank you. Um, we have contacted you about um, being a consultant for us for the application to um, shepherd this project through SHPO. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your firm, um, and your experience? Sure. Uh, my name is Peter Primavera. I'm the managing principal of Peter Primavera Partners. It was founded in 2010. Um, the previous firm that I founded when I was 24 years old in my PhD graduate program uh, was called Cultural Resource Consulting Group. That firm was sold to one of the major engineering firms in New Jersey. Uh, but my phone kept ringing and I kept getting clients asking me to help them out do, do projects. So I started Peter Primavera Partners and have for about 10 years now. Uh, it's the exact same pro kind of projects. Uh, the professionals on our staff are archaeologists, historians, architectural historians, conservators, and then a raft of various specialists, whether they're 
uh, specialist in landscape architecture, historic landscape architecture, historic uh, structures, uh, historic uh, masonry. It depends on the project that we call this this vast group of people together in. So it's a, in the sense the new firm is a is is a collaborative because we draw in so many different kinds of of expertise, uh, which we had done primarily in house before. And so uh, the firm uh, works in the public and private sector. Um, the vast majority of our work is done under regulatory compliance, meaning uh, we, most of our projects are being done because there are state, federal, or municipal laws, regulations, or ordinances that apply to the protection of historic resources. And we'll talk about that in a minute because you've got all three in this particular case. Uh, you don't have the federal, but you've got the state and the municipal, and you've got two kinds of state protection. Um, so my particular expertise within the firm has been the regulatory environment and working with the SHPO. Uh, I've worked with the New Jersey SHPO longer than anybody that's working there now. Uh, and can remember that office back in 1975 uh, when it was at 201 State Street in, Print, in, in Trenton. Uh, and we work with them on a regular basis on multiple types of regulations, uh, state, federal regulations that the SHPO office is involved in. Additionally, we're involved in a lot of municipalities that have historic preservation ordinances that have issues that come before them that aren't necessarily even regulatory by a historic preservation ordinance. And in fact, we've got that going on in, in Paramus right now. We've got three different projects going on in Paramus where we've got 18th century buildings that are, uh, uh, their, their historic preservation commission doesn't meet anymore. It doesn't function anymore. Even though they have an ordinance and they have a weak ordinance, uh, we're trying to work in all three of those cases with planning board, zoning board, board of adjustment, mayor and council on how to find the best resolution on saving those historic buildings and at the same time achieving some kind of property development or some kind of setback or easements and things like that. Uh, so that would be typical kinds of projects that we do. And tell us a little bit about your firm. How many people, how many partners? Uh, I'm the only partner. Uh, right now, we're, we, keep it we keep it small, about six people, and uh, we have about 37 or 38 uh, regular, if you will, gig employees, contract employees that work on specific projects. And then there's probably that many more that are also pre-selected professionals. So we're doing a project right down in, in New Hope, for example, right now on the water. And it's right up against the water, and so we need a specialized, not only structural engineer in that case, but we need one that knows how to deal with a historic stone retaining wall against the Delaware River. So in that case, we brought in a structural engineer with specifically that kind of expertise to be part of the team. And that's how we assemble each team. So is it fair to say that you work to preserve historic properties? That's what we do every day. And, excuse me. That's what we do every day. Uh, and I've, I started working when I was 16 years old at the University of Pennsylvania with the legendary archaeologist uh, uh, that was head of the University Museum at the time. And uh, I was still a high school student in Cherry Hill and then went on uh, to pursue my childhood dream, which was to work in history and preservation and archaeology which I did all the way through undergraduate, graduate, and then when I was 24 years old, founded my own firm. And since then, we've done over 4,000 projects uh, all around the East Coast and some all, other parts of the country. And we've even worked in uh, other countries. Uh, how, how many times have you appeared before SHPO? How many times have I appeared before SHPO? Mm -hmm. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't even count how many times because there's always multiple projects in our office that are being reviewed by SHPO, because SHPO has a number of programs. They have the State Register Act, which is this regulation that you'll come under for getting your approval. 
Uh, they run the state and national register. That's another program they run. Uh, you were talking about your downtown program and your historic preservation commission. Those are two other kinds of programs they run using federal money. So we work with SHPO across the board, everybody there on a regular, regular basis. And, ha and have been since we, since before I started my firm, when I was back as a research assistant in my uh, days as a research assistant for two archaeologists in Princeton. Have you had many governmental clients? Many governmental clients. Uh, uh, Could you give us a sampling both at the, or at the municipal, state, and federal level? Well, uh, municipal, uh, we worked in Birch. I can't say we worked in every 566 municipalities, but we worked in pretty close to all of them in New Jersey. We worked in all 21 counties. Um, we've worked for uh, municipalities in this kind of situation. We've worked in or municipalities that needed archaeological services, that needed uh, surveys of historic sites. That's something we just recently did in North Plainfield, New Jersey. We designated a National Register Historic District, which is called the Washington Park Historic District. Because most people don't realize in New Jersey, just a side note for the history lovers in the room, uh, that there are more Victorian houses in Plainfield and North Plainfield than there are in Cape May. And uh, we designated one of the largest historic districts recently in North Plainfield for the city of Plainfield. And in that case, that would be an example of, Mayor, how we teamed up. I brought in a specialist architect on that project, Barton Ross, uh, who had particular expertise, and we teamed up on that to produce the best product for what the objective was. Uh, so we can, we've been involved in Main Street programs, which are also uh, uh, run through the uh, uh, SHPO office, partly through the SHPO office and partly through DCA. Uh, I was the executive director of downtown New Jersey for a year and a half and a member of downtown New Jersey, the statewide organization dedicated to main streets and downtowns for 20 some years. Uh, so we worked on state agencies, everything from we did the entire study of the entire uh, 22 municipalities that make up the Hacken Hackensack Meadowlands Development Commission. Uh, as part of their master plan, we looked for any possible historic archaeological events, sites, archaeological sites that could exist when they did the master plan for the, H for the Meadowlands. Uh, for years, we've been a consultant for the Delaware and Raritan Canal Commission. The entire, entire Delaware and Raritan Canal is on the National Register of Historic Places. It's run by the New Jersey Water Supply Authority. They use it as an actual aqueduct. But all of the approvals, because it's on the register, require us going to SHPO and getting whatever kinds of permits, depending on the project, that uh, are required. Pe pe the permits that SHPO administers can be state permits, but also they have been delegated uh, under the Wetlands Assumption Act of, what, 1988. Uh, they, they oversee the federal preservation programs too, the New Jersey Ship Bowl. Uh, state DOT, uh, probably the largest project we ever did was the Route 1 uh, uh, widening of uh, state, state uh, highway Route 1 from uh, New Brunswick to Trenton. Worked for the DEP, the Schools Construction Authority, uh, for the federal government, we worked for the Army Corps, the FAA, the Department of Defense, HUD, General Service Administration, Federal Transportation Administration. And then on the private sector, that tends to be, very frankly, uh, where Peter Primavera is different than my previous firm. We work a little bit more in the, in the public, in the, in the private sector. So we have more clients like uh, Columbia University or uh, uh, Monmouth University. We did the restoration of the National Historic Landmark, uh, Woodrow Wilson Hall, which if you know Monmouth University, that's their feature building. It's one of only 30, one of only 51 National Historic Landmarks in, in New Jersey. Uh, we worked with Columbia University. We worked with, we did the 
who were on the team with the architects Cooper Robertson that did the master plan for the new Alston campus at Harvard University, which is the new campus that there is now under construction across the Charles River, where the football stadium is. Uh, so uh, then I have a lot, a lot, a lot of private clients who are everything from banks to developers to people who are individual homeowners. Uh, a month or two ago, I was in front of the Milburn Historic Preservation Commission with a homeowner who has a house in the uh, Short Hills Historic District, and uh, they had a fire. They want to redo the house. They want to upgrade it for the family. They want to do it in a historically sensitive way. Milburn has a historic preservation ordinance. So I represented them with their architect to try to get the approval, uh, from, and we did get the approval from uh, the Milburn Historic Preservation Commission. So it's the gamut. I, I, I apologize if I was all over the place, but we've done over 4,000 projects and uh, from every imaginable uh, part of the public sector to the private sector. Got it. And I'm going to digress for just a moment. Um, Heather, I know that you had an opportunity to contact uh, some of his references. Can you tell us what you learned? Sure. I spoke to um, one reference that used him in the private sector. He said he's very knowledgeable. His fees are reasonable. Um, I, I also I spoke. Hear, I'm sorry. I couldn't hear what you said. Okay, I said I spoke with one of your references, Steve Santola. He used you in the private sector. He said that you are very knowledgeable and your fees are reasonable. Um, Jordan Tannenbaum. He serves as the vice chair, which is the second-ranking federal historic preservation official in the United States of the Federal Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. He said that Mr. Primavera understands the process, he is well versed in the preservation field, and he is qualified to do this type of work. Steve Sinisi is an attorney whose client is presently before the Paramus Planning Board at, the, um, at this time. The client wishes to develop a site which is on a local historic registry. Mr. Sinisi said that Mr. Primavera testified and knows about local county, state, and national registries. He said it was a pleasure to work with him. And then Catherine Miller, she's the administrator of North Plainfield, as Mr. Primavera said. They did a historic district survey of 214 historic homes in the town. Um, and then she said he also knows the historic preservation field. He works with historical architects. Um, she mentioned Barton Ross and historic planners. She said that Mr. Primavera is very convincing. And she said that she had a favorable experience with Mr. Primavera and would um, gladly hire him again. Thanks, Heather. Um, I guess the final thing I would say is uh, I've been sworn in by hundreds of state, federal, and particular municipal, municipal bodies, whether they are historic preservation commissions, zoning boards, planning boards, boards of adjustment, a lot of historic preservation commissions, uh, and have not had my uh, credentials denied as an expert in the field of historic preservation in 36 years. So you were certified as an expert by all these courts? Pardon me? You were certified as an expert by all these courts? By? By all the courts you just described. You, you were a certified expert witness. Do not necessarily. There's not, a, yeah, there's not a certification, but it's an acceptance as right. an expert in the, in the field. And it's their administrative bodies, their development bodies, the zoning board, planning board, those are those are development bodies. They're not actually courts, but they're, you know. They're but you know, not, not certified. Certified and then he's certified to give an opinion, which is not something that witnesses get to do normally in a court of law. Is what I was getting at. Right. Yes. To right. be accepted as an expert to be able to render an opinion. Uh, Mr. Primavera, uh, I know you've had an opportunity to review this project. Um, can you give us your general thoughts? Um, what I did is uh, when I was introduced to the project in concept, and very recently, Chris the engineer had uh, shown me two of the concepts just within the last couple of weeks that you're thinking about. Um, my response was to come back to council and say, the first, there, there, there are probably several tasks that have to be done to get through any kind of approval process with the uh, state agencies. And the only, and it's not just the, the SHPO, it's also the New Jersey Historic Trust. Um, and I'll explain that in a minute. Um, the way you go about getting those approvals is like any project, you do good due diligence. And so what I've proposed 
to the town and the document that you've got is a very, very thorough due diligence um, uh, study to find out everything that's been done before now, looked at the National Register nomination, looked at the work that my colleague Richard Hunter has done archaeologically, look at, I've worked on hundreds of uh, Revolutionary War sites in New Jersey, and uh, look at that association, try to gather all the pieces, and then at the same time try to gather all the pieces about what you're trying to accomplish as a government <coughs> agency and what it is you would like to be presented to the ship for approval. Uh, I know there's been lots of conversations. I have not been privy to any of those. I haven't spoken to the ship about this project at all because uh, I don't, I haven't been engaged and I don't represent you and I don't know enough about the project. Uh, if the one fellow is worried about why I took his picture, uh, I took it as part of my due diligence because one of the things I have to do under the New Jersey State Register Act. Peter, uh, excuse me, is, please speak into the microphone. One of the things I have to do under the New Jersey State Register Act is I have to identify parties that are pro, parties that are con, and also people that may have expertise that I don't have or are knowledgeable about local history or local factors that can contain can be considered in the process of getting a project improved. So I'm trying to, for the first time tonight, uh, I heard a lot of people that uh, had issues with the project. I'm trying to become familiar with this group of people because I'm going to be working with them uh, to elicit, elicit their, their comments. Anyone who knows anything about the Revolutionary War activity, about the House, I have to go back and review the entire process that was done, and Heather and I started this I'd ask her uh, early on, um, how was the restoration of the house funded? And it's my understanding, I've been talking to Heather and Chris, I still don't have all that information, but a big part of the, of the funding was from the New Jersey Historic Trust, which is not the SHPO. The New Jersey Historic Trust is part of the State Department, it's part of DCA, and you probably got, a, uh, I suppose, a three to one matching grant for the bricks and mortar work you did. And you might have gotten a grant also for uh, the architect, uh, Connolly and Hickey, who did the designs. And so uh, one of the things that I want to look at is are there restrictions that were uh, attached to you receiving the money? Facade easements, deed restrictions. Did, it, did they deed restrict just the house or all seven acres? or just some sort of certain parts of the area. In the mention earlier about um, uh, Richard Hunter's work, one of the things I need to do is find out what he's done, where he's looked, and where he would be planning to look next, because we've got to demonstrate to the SHPO that we've identified where there are archaeological sites or not, and where we might impact them or not. So the phase two that you've talked about uh, that, that Hunter would do, that is uh, something that I've got to talk to him about once you settle on your plan so you do it where you're going to disturb the ground. You don't do the phase two in portions of the property they are not going to be disturbed or that the historic trust did not consider archaeologically sensitive. So there's a lot of pieces. So my proposal right now is to try to um, gather information from anybody and everybody who wants to send it to me. Uh, uh, somebody mentioned uh, uh, receiving a letter from the uh, Sons of the American Revolution. I am, in fact, a certified son of the American Revolution with seven ancestors who fought in the American Revolution for the Patriots. Uh, so I'm active in the Westfield chapter. Active, active in a number of those organizations. And I know a lot of those people, and I know a lot of those people that might have specific information about particular Revolutionary War activity that happened in this area. That seems to be a sensitivity that I'm hearing from not only the National Register nomination, from other people about was there British, British uh, or other kinds of military uh, encampment or troop movement or skirmishes in this area. Part of what I'm trying to do is gather what everybody already knows. And then once we do that, then I'm going to come back with a report to you, uh, which 
paints out what I think is the strategy for how we can go about pursuing the approvals. And the approvals may be a slightly modified version. That might, might, I might recommend a slightly modified version of the plan you were talking about tonight because it might have archaeological resources in a certain area or it's too close to the house or the New Jersey Historic Trust might have deed restricted part of, the, part of the property. So there may be things right now that exist that I don't know of that I haven't looked into yet that may already restrict you and probably do already restrict what you can and can't do. And then we look into the alternatives, the mitigations, and the way we can work with those agencies to accomplish what Ridgewood wants to accomplish eventually. And Mr. Prever so it's an iterative. Pro it's very much an iterative process. But in this case, it's iterative in that you know we've got a lot of different uh, uh, information from the town, from the county, uh, from the state, two state agencies, and then I think uh, the house got some money from the Bergen County Historic Trust too. Uh, the, and so I want to find out. Uh, I I talked to uh, Heather and I talked to Chris about digging up their files, and I said, They're gonna, I'm going to spend a whole day with you going through your files, because I want to see each one of those grants, and each one of those grants have either restrictions or don't. And were the, were the restrictions done properly or not? And were the restrictions done in accordance with what's significant or not? And what is your proposed timeline and proposed cost for this first level? The due diligence study we should be able to do in uh, – uh, I think when you and I last discussed it, you know, if we were to say go in most situations, it'd be about a three-week period. This one, I think, is going to be about four uh, to get to the due diligence process. Uh, I need access to everybody. If I call, if I email, you know, if you know of anybody that has information about the history of this piece of property, I want to know it. I want to know more about this property than anybody so that I can supply it back to you and you can make the most informed decision from a historic preservation standpoint about what the right thing to do is. And what is the proposed cost of this Pardon report? Pardon me? What is the proposed cost uh, of this I report? Think the, I think I had uh, a proposal that had about seven or eight tasks, but for now, I'm not, you know, proposing to do the application to the state because we don't even know what we're doing yet. I need to do this due diligence. So I think the uh, coordination and the due diligence together was about $6,800, something like that. And that would produce a report that uh, does uh, a, a pretty good job, a very good job, of gathering all these sources of information. But I, I have to caution, you know, in all probability, uh, history and archaeology are detective work. And sometimes you open a door and there's something there you didn't expect. And I have to come back to you and say, oh my, uh, there's something about the Revolutionary War, there's something about Civil War, there's something about George Washington, there's something about slavery, there's something about Black History Month you know, uh, that, that's been brought up. There's something, you know, some other historical thing. Or what oftentimes happens, some of those things fade away because they've become legend or myth over time. So then I reapportion my budget to go to where I need to go in the due diligence. So that's what I think it's going to take to do it uh, and give you a strong recommendation about which direction to go. And that recommendation is going to come with some uh, strong recommendations about the design of the project, too. Thank you. Um, uh, our residents have raised some concerns yes. about um, things that you have been involved in and that you have done. There was, some, there was a newspaper article about a 1987 charge against you, a criminal charge. Can you tell us about that? Uh, in 1988, uh, I was a 20-something year old, right out of starting my firm, uh, president of my first firm, presenting before uh, uh, the planning board in New Brunswick. And there was an incident where I had said I'd completed my master's degree, and that was not exactly correct. I misspoke. Uh, the uh, matter was turned over to Middlesex County uh, law, enforcement, law Division, and uh, they looked into it. They looked into what I said, why I said, why I said it, what my intention is, did I have an intention to deceive, and they decided that 
there would not be a formal uh, indictment or court proceeding, but there would be a pretrial intervention program, which is a program where you're basically forgiven as long as for five or six years or whatever the number was, you don't do anything that's against the law again. And uh, it was a, uh, a fourth degree uh, offense, which is the lowest. And um, uh, one of the things I could have done um, after that is I could have had my attorneys go back and expunge the record that that never even existed uh, because that's what the PTI program in New Jersey allows. I never did because we got so busy and we've done so many thousands of projects. I've never had my qualifications uh, uh, or those of my firm questioned and, or denied. And any agency at the time that did have questions, like for example, New Jersey DOT, we went down and sat down with them, explained the situation, explained the legal procedures, explained the credentials I had, the credentials my firm had, and New Jersey DOT kept us as one of their consultants. Thank you. Uh, my last question is, um, our residents have raised other concerns regarding more recent charges or arrests. Um, can you tell us anything about that? Uh, other arrests? Uh, well, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not fully familiar with them. If you could just tell us about any, um, any uh, other problems that you've had that are I've residents. had no problems related to my professional credentials or from my professional career. And uh, uh, I don't think I'm here tonight to talk about my personal life. Thank you very much. That's all I have. Um, I'll turn it over. Um, Evan, do you have anything? Um, so just to be clear, I mean, can you give us just some of the examples of, can you give us some of the examples of municipalities or federal governments that have employed you in the last 10 years? Some uh, an example is uh, Union County had asked us to do a study of the entire Union County park system, which mm -hmm. was originally conceived of by Frederick, Frederick Law Olmsted. Mm -hmm. Uh, the actual parks were then designed by his son. The old man passed away, mm -hmm. but uh, we studied the entire uh, Union County park system. Somerset County employed us to study all 21 municipalities at a reconnaissance and an intensive level over that ex period in 1989. Uh, they ha rehired us in the middle of that uh, to do a very intensive level study of all 21 municipalities in, in Somerset County to identify over 4,200 sites in Somerset County that were either historic sites or, or potential historic sites or that weren't really. Or maybe they, maybe, maybe they, this is a very typical scenario when we work for government. Maybe it's, a, maybe a site is significant enough to be a Ridgefield, a Ridgewood site, but maybe not National Register or a National Historic Landmark. Or maybe it's a National Historic Landmark and they didn't even know they had it. And so uh, our job is to go in and evaluate the significance of what we find and produce that and then in some cases you use the regulatory process. And so I mean, um, besides those would be a couple, I can give you plenty more if you like. Yeah, no, I mean, because I, I don't think everybody else has what I have in front of me, but it says that you've worked for Princeton, for Rutgers, doing projects for them as well. Is that true? Rutgers, uh, I was, uh, I've been very close with Rutgers for years and years and years. Uh, the Rutgers projects, uh, the last one I did was I was asked and I agreed as a donation as an alumni to help design an international design competition to do the uh, College Avenue uh, uh, design competition where we had over 15 world-class architects uh, come in and compete to design the master plan for the College Avenue campus. Uh, the university uh, returned uh, the favor and made me the jury chairman of the uh, jury. And so we had four Pritzker Prize winners, some of the most famous architects in the world, like Jean Nouvel, uh, uh, I can go on and on. Mm -hmm. and, and in that case, uh, ran the design competition for Rutgers. Often regularly have done other things with Rutgers, which are smaller projects. Uh, there's a small building on the Douglas College campus and we happen to have a specialty and subspecialties where they wanted to repaint the building. And, it, and I had been telling them for years it needed to be repainted, that it was rotting underneath all these layers of paint. So they hired our firm 
and we went and got the exact type of conservation specialists who know about historic paint. And so the dean's office on the Douglas College campus now is the color it was originally, mm. and the paint was done historically accurately. So you can see this, the, the range is enormous. Yeah, so I just have one comment, and that is one of the things that you said that struck me was um, in terms of you don't know what you're going to find until you look. Um, if this council does hire you, um, I want to be clear that we're not giving you a mandate. I want to hear what you find. I'm not, I don't want you to come to a result that you think any of us want to hear. I just want to hear what the truth is. My understanding and what I wrote in the document that I submitted so far is all I'm doing is helping you decide how you're going to proceed through the regulatory process. Because you've got several, pro I don't even know how many processes right now. You know, I, I know you got money from Bergen County. Did they attach strings to that? I don't know. I know the New Jersey Historic Trust always does, but I don't know because I haven't looked at your project yet what the strings are. The New Jersey, New Jersey SHPO, under the New Jersey State Register Act, has the authority to tell municipalities what they should do with properties that are listed on the state register. So the Zabriskie House, as I, what I call it, the Zabriskie House, and I think there's an earlier date, the earlier name too, uh, is, is uh, on the state register. So under the State Register Act, the SHPO has an involvement. So my primary product to you is not going to be do this. It's going to be here are the ways to navigate this process in the most efficient way. Here's my recommendation. Here's the pros and cons of do we go to the trust first? Do we go to the SHPO first? Do we get them together in the same room? What's the best way to do it? Uh, in the most efficient way so that one, uh, we're cost efficient, two, we're doing high quality preservation because the building is obviously on the National Register and has historical significance and the town's making the best decision. Good. Siobhan? Um, so I have two questions. Have you ever worked with Connolly and Hickey? Before? I can't hear you. Have you ever worked with Connolly and Hickey before? Oh, yeah. I've known Margaret. Margaret actually uh, started her career at the New Jersey Historic Trust. Okay. So I, I know them, and I know that they had worked on the house. And uh, one of the things I said to Chris when I met Chris, uh, he showed me the plan for some of the things to be attached to the house, and I said, stop. Stop, stop, stop. We need to, one, see what Hunter has done in their archaeological survey where their sensitivities are. We need to examine, and this may be one of those closets we were talking about, uh, what's your program for that house? I we mean, don't have one yet. Exactly. <laughs> we don't have and, one. And, and, and council person, uh, I, I, I'm in councils every single day virtually, I mean, not literally, but uh, the people at the ship will tell you the last thing in New Jersey needs is another historic house museum. We, we've got so many of them, and they're not funded, and they're not taken care of, and they're not manned, and they're not used. The ship is going to come back and say, get creative. What, could, what, could, what can you use this for? And they may give us some leniency in what we can do to the building if it turns into an art center, if it turns into something associated with athletics. I'm just, whatever the program is. But, you know, I'm not saying no to it being a historic house museum, but I am telling you that's going to be a hard sell at SHPO because SHPO knows that municipalities do a terrible job, and I'm not blaming you and not blame, backing you into this. Municipalities do t basically a terrible job of taking care of historic house museums because they're very underfunded and they're very underused. You know, how many historic house museums do you have in Bergen County, for example, that you know, nobody ever gets to go inside because they're only on, open on the third Saturday or something. And, and, and that just defeats the whole purpose of historic preservation. If you're not bringing the history, if you're not bringing the story to the people, uh, but if you can do that with a different program. So to uh, Mr. White's question, that's what, you, that's what I'm trying to do in my product is say, Here's the constraints, and we, I already know we got a lot of them, and I got to spend a lot of time with Chris and with Matt uh, reading all these documents. Uh, here's the constraints. Within the constraints, what can we do? Here's what you want to do. How do we get there? And 
and that's my second question is with the constraints how fluid is the process do you just keep going and then get denied is it each, iterative it, the, the, each each regulation has its own and that's part of what I do best is try to match up where you've got more than one regulation to get those agencies to say New Jersey Historic Trust we're going to defer to the SHPO or you know your Historic Preservation Commission we want to know what they think mm -hmm. and how, how they're going to contribute to what we're going to do and the alternatives we're going to suggest so each one of them and that'll be that'll be my report is it's going to be showing you the, the legislation the regulations and the timelines associated with each of those the State Register Act is probably the, going to be the most time-consuming. That's the one that's regulated by the SHPO. Uh, the State Register Act uh, can can make. I won't go into great detail right now, but uh, you can get you can get through there in six to nine months, uh, and in a, in a project where you have issues, and we've got issues. We know we've got issues. You know, we're we're built we're building we're not we're building on the National Register site. Uh, how much of it's on the register? How much of it deserves to be on the register? What part of it was on the register that should have gotten the most protection as opposed to least protection? That may dictate how we do additions to the house, for, exa for example. Excuse me. So uh, I didn't answer your question. No, no you didn't. But I, what I did tell you is one of the things that Matt's going to know more historic preservation law than he ever wanted to in his whole life because we're going to paint out all of these different paths and then we're going to try to make them work in the most efficient way. And so that, the pu and, and, and so that everyone knows the public is involved all the way through. And when someone saw me talking, pic taking pictures today, I was doing that. I was demonstrating that the first time I ever showed up to a meeting with Ridgewood was the public was represented. And that will be an ongoing process is identifying anybody, whether they're from Ridgewood or from wherever, that has something helpful uh, to say about the history and the significance and the possible uses. Good. Lorraine? Thank a little you. bit long-winded, I'm no, sorry, but it's, okay. we are, we are, it's a really complicated thing we're dealing with here. Hi. Hi. Thank, thank you, Mr. Primavera. Um, let me just start with one thing you said that caught my ear, six to nine months. So I have been saying we are not going to be doing anything in the year 2023, like shovels in the ground, spending a lot of money. Do you agree? I mean, when would you foresee if everything goes the way you want it to go and we get approvals, we would start? We're, um, already, we're already, not to be sarcastic, we're already in the, by the time I'm, if, if, if you decide to hire our firm, we're already in the fourth month. So. How are we already in the fourth month? April. It's April. So. Right. No, and it's six to nine months from now. So, so when you say, are we going to be shoveled in the ground in 2003, I don't see how. Right. Okay. That's. Yeah. I, I, because we're already in the fourth month, and if we go through a uh, six to nine month approval process, and then there's always going to be something, and. And, and council person, I, I, I would go back to uh, elucidate my answer to your question, and that is saying all those doors the detective has to open, I haven't opened them yet. Right. So. Okay. No, that that's fine. I just yeah. wanted to clarify that so, because. So yeah, I, I think. There's a know, question about our budget, anyway, and I don't want to put extra money if it's just going to we're going to bond it, and the residents are going to be paying yeah. for it this year where our money could go elsewhere to safety issues. So I just wanted and, and to clarify to your point, that. I, I, would, I, would, I would say, um, and I think I had this brief discussion with some of the members of the council, is probably the first thing I'm going to say is stop. Stop. And stop drawing, right? Stop doing all these other kinds of things. Let's, let's find out what we got. Let's find out what the state's going to let us do. You know, why, why go design out this and that and the other and all this other stuff when the state's going to come back and say, 
that's good or that's not good or I'll let you do it. We're going to have to mitigate for it. Mm -hmm. My job right now is to get all the ducks in an order and, and, and to see what Chris has done so far. But I told him when I met him, uh, stop. Okay. Stop. You know, unless the mayor tells him otherwise or you tell him otherwise, um, uh, I need to know what the constraints are. Otherwise, I would be misleading you. Mm -hmm. into a design that I don't know what the constraints are. Okay, so a few things. What is your education? What do you have your degree in? Anthropology. Okay. I started out as an anthropologist when I was 15. And it's a BA. A that BS, is. and then I started the PhD program at Rutgers, and when I was 24, I left to start my own firm. Okay. And then since then, I've done uh, additional uh, postgraduate work at Rutgers and Harvard University and But do you have a places. higher degree than a BA? No. Okay. So one of the questions I have is I was reading that it said any architect or historian that, you know, if we're working on a house that has received federal funds, which I do believe we have, you would need a graduate degree. Yeah, but I'm not an architect or historian. Oh. I'm a historian. A historian doesn't need a graduate degree to do that. Okay. 36 CFR 61 is the federal regulation that spells out what the regulations are. Those are the regulations that are used by the state and the feds, and those are actually cited in the municipal land use law in New Jersey, and I have the qualifications to be considered a historian. Okay. And, and on top of that, there is no prof professional qualification in the state of New Jersey. There is in some states to be a historic preservation professional and uh, the question came, uh, like at Paramus, I've been recognized three times this year as a historic preservation professional, as somebody who knows the field. Okay. Can so, we talk no, about... I, I would not pretend to be Margaret Hickey because she's an architectural historian, and she's also an architect. Okay. So can we talk about some of the projects you worked on? Um, sure. In... in all of the information we got, and excuse me if I'm going back and forth, because I got most of this information today. I've had issues with, with emails. So um, there's a picture of Beth Shalom Synagogue in Elkins Park, PA. What did you have to do with that? Uh, Beth Shalom, that's probably, thank you for asking that question, because that's one of the proudest projects I ever did in my entire life. Frank Lloyd Wright, towards the end of his career, after his career had faded, uh, was commissioned by the Beth Shalom uh, congregation in Elkins Park, Pennsylvania, to design one of the only the only synagogue he ever designed, and uh, it is spectacular. And it's it, when you drive up to it, the, it's a beautiful picture. It's unbelievable. And 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 he he did the Unity Temple, but he never done a synagogue. And uh, what was interesting about that, not to nerd out on history a little bit too much, but but. But the, the, the rabbi was tough as nails. And as, as, as Frank Lloyd Wright's clients all, all said, you hired Frank, and then somewhere during the project, you worked for Frank, because he had such an attitude. And that, 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 that uh, rabbi never, he fired Wright several times on that project. But they still built it. And so the congregation came to us and said, Peter, we got tour buses pulling up in front of our congregation, and we don't have docents, we don't have tours, we don't have exhibits, we don't have, we've got a leaky roof and we've got a defective heating system. And so what we said to them is, you've got a building that deserves to be on the highest level of designation in the United States, and that is a National Historic Landmark. There's only about 2,600 of those in the whole country, and you're thinking of some of them right now. Uh, and so we nominated as a National Historic Landmark uh, we brought in the famous architecture firm Robert Venturi from Philadelphia, uh, Pritzker Prize winner. He designed uh, public use space in the bottom of the building that they weren't using at all. And then that opened them up to various grants that they could say, we're a historic landmark. And so, for example, you can only get money from the Getty Trust in California if you're a National Historic Landmark. So they were able to do window repairs, heating repairs, ADA improvements. And now they've actually got a functioning foundation, which we help them put together, that uh, they have docents, they have regular tour guides, they have 
tchotchkes you can buy in their gift shop. Um, so that's what we did at Best Shalom. Okay. And, and I'm very, very proud of that one. What it about was, it, it was amazing to me the day I went to Best Shalom and somebody told me, this is not on any register at all. And I said, that's not possible. What about Lucy? 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 Lucy, Lucy, I've been consulting with, uh, believe it or not, people never believe it when I say it, the uh, president and chairman of the board of the Save Lucy Foundation is a fellow named Richard Helfant. Not Elephant, but Helfant. And uh, I've been working with Richard on various strategies about um, for over four years. And that's a National Historic Landmark, like uh, it, New Jersey has 57 National Historic Landmarks. Mm -hmm. Lucy is one of them. And so Richard and I contact regularly on a number of preservation issues. Uh, in fact, his architect uh, was hired by uh, the Rutgers University Press to write the history of uh, Lucy. And she called me and she said, this is more than I can handle and she's asked me to do it. So they've got funding for me to write the, the definitive history. There have been lots of little picture book histories, but none really, really, really fine. And, uh, and then there's a lot of deceptive stuff. Like someone told me the other day there was, uh, Lucy appears in the HBO Boardwalk something series, and, and it's all digitized. It's not real. It's not really. <laughs> they use her as a backdrop. So um, yeah, that's something I'm doing with them, helping them with funding, helping them with tourism, helping them with, uh, also one of the things we do is try to put sites to not reinvent wheels. So part of you'll see in my recommendations is I had this happen in such and such a town already. Here's what they decided to do and why. So that's what we do in places like Lucy and others. Okay. Uh, you're, 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 not, you're, you're going to see recommendations from other municipalities who had the same situation and w what they decided and whether it was the right decision or not. Uh, what did you do? Because nobody, uh, we've done it thousands of times. No reason to redo it. Okay. What did you have? Princeton Battlefield National Historic Landmark? Yeah, I worked what on the Princeton you? Battlefield seven times uh, since uh, the early 80s. We've done seven different studies. The first study we did was the Princeton Sewer Operating Authority that wanted to put a, 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 a sewer trunk line around the west side of Princeton along the Stony Brook, if you know Princeton. And that was going to be a collector system. Well, that was going to have to actually affect and partly be built in the battlefield. And we did massive historical research, massive uh, research of all the buildings in the area, and we did massive amounts of archaeological research in advance of that. And one of the things that we're most proud of we did is up to that point, no one had ever really reconstructed the battle for Princeton. People talk about it like, you know, the Battle of Princeton, it sounds like it's a several day event. And Washington was there, that's true, uh, and it was pivotal, but the Battle of Princeton was 45 minutes long. And you needed to know how it started and where the British were and where Washington was and where the gun emplacement were and where the, where the Washington oak tree that everybody talks about that was not there when the battle happened. We needed to get all the facts straight. So Princeton hired us on numerous other occasions to come back. And um, we actually consulted with the Institute for Advanced Studies uh, a number of years ago when they wanted to build some new faculty housing uh, adjacent to the battlefield. And people from Princeton said the battlefield really is bigger, in fact, than what's designated. And they were right. They were right. The, what was designated, the boundaries, the state park, which is also what's on the National Register. If you reconstruct the battle, it actually should have been bigger than that. And so we were able to advise on how they could build new buildings and do the least amount of encroachment, to, uh, diminishment to the significance of the battle. Okay. But that's, uh, again, thank you for asking me about that one because that one I've been involved in for 30 years on various Just, different levels. Okay. Just a couple questions on memberships and positions you've held. Um, National Landmarks Alliance. Yes. Says you're our founder and president That's from correct. 
2010? That's correct. To now, current, that's current? That's current and that's a nascent organization. It would be hard for me to say that that organization is really up and running. There was a predecessor organization that the National Park Service started called the National Landmark Stewards Association. I was on that board. That board and that organization failed and so I went to National Park Service and was given an award for starting a new organization and trying to get it going. So I've been working for the past 10 years on getting the new organization. Uh, and the primary, my primary goal there is uh, uh, the National Historic Landmarks are the 2,600 most nationally significant sites in the country, and therefore they deserve the highest level of protection. And they don't have anybody to speak for them. So that's what we're trying to do with putting the National Landmarks Alliance together. We're trying to get the right people who can speak for them uh, in Congress, in their local towns, when I did Monmouth University, I mentioned before, when I did Woodrow Wilson Hall at Monmouth University, they asked us to come and help them do a restoration plan for, for Woodrow Wilson Hall. And I went to the first meeting, I said, you know, Woodrow Wilson never slept in this building. And they'd been calling it Woodrow Wilson Hall ever since it was Monmouth University. He slept in the previous mansion that was there. The mansion that was built there was built in 1929 for $10 million dollars and designed by the famous architect Horace Trumbauer. And so Monmouth University had a national historical landmark. It would be like you know, us having the Princeton Battlefield here in Ridgewood and not knowing that it was a national historic landmark. So we've ended up in that situation a number of times, Beth Shalom being an example. Okay. How about the New York Landmarks Conservancy? The New York Landmarks Conservancy? It says professional circle. The professional circle, that's just an organization you join. Uh, the New York Landmarks uh, Conservancy uh, has like a professionals group and you can just join and pay yearly and be part of that okay. group. Okay. So and, are and, a lot then, of like, these they things? Can give you a name, they, like, they can give your name out if somebody calls and says, hey, do you know that somebody that does something like Peter or, you know, an architect or things like that. So are, are a lot of these things that you mentioned as membership and positions held similar to that? You just join, you pay your dues? Oh, all sorts of things. I was, I mean, until this year, I was for three years on the National Board of Preservation Action, which is the national lobbying group advocating for historic preservation across the country. Uh, that and the National Organization of State sh SHPOs worked together. And I was on the Board of Preservation Action, lobbying for legislation, funding, things like that. So that, that one, I was an active member of the board. Uh, I've been on, I think, 12 boards. Okay. Uh, What's the preservation? I, I, a lot of the organizations that I have, I, I'm just on the organization because I need to keep up on what they're doing and their literature and the research. What is the Preservation Alliance of Greater Philadelphia? That is Philadelphia's historical preservation organization. And mm -hmm. uh, they came to our firm a number of years ago and said, Philly doesn't have enough money and believe it or not, as historic as Philadelphia is, Philly doesn't know how many historic districts it has. That was the actual pr uh, problem that was posed to me. We don't know how many historic districts. So the greater, the alliance, the greater Philadelphia Preservation Alliance has a lot of fundraising ability. They said to the city, this is badly needed. You don't even know what historic districts you've got. You've got people coming in with all sorts of proposals for all sorts of things. So they hired us, and we actually inventoried all of the historic districts in Philadelphia, whether they be Philadelphia-designated, state, federal, or anything. And then we identified a series of about 40 other potential historic districts that could be considered at some point in the future. So that was a project for the city, but it was paid for by the nonprofit Greater Preservation Alliance. Okay. So how did, how did Ridgewood, how did you come to be here? How did, how did Ridgewood find you? Do you know? Yeah, I got a phone call, uh, I think, from Heather. Do you know when? How long ago? A month or two ago or something like that? Was that it or, or was it? It wasn't from me. Uh, no, oh, no, it was from, no, it was from, from me. The first call was from, from, from the mayor. Okay. Yeah. And how long and ago he, was and, that? And the mayor at the time 
had gotten a recommendation from Gail Price, of Price Mies, the land use attorney that's very popular in this area. Uh, he said, we've got a historic issue and who's the best person to do it? And she recommended me. And so the mayor called me at Gail Price's recommendation. Okay. That's how it happened, right? Yep. So, and then I talk, and but then you I talk were in contact with Because I needed information from Heather after In November, that. correct? I don't remember exactly when I spoke to him. Okay, because in, but in I, this no, I, I information, reached, I reached a, out to him just like that. But before you were mayor. I don't remember okay. specifically. Well, I mean, in here there's an email from November 28th, 2022. So that's where I'm, I, I mean, I, nothing against you. I'm just, I think this is a little bit of a slippery slope where I believe Gail is your lawyer. You know, it, it seems to be a little bit of a conflict of interest. I would like to, you know, Gail's husband is also on the Parks and Rec and Preservation Committee. He's been <laughs> pro the big field. It, it just doesn't look right to me. I uh, think I'm we should how have. Is, how, how is either a conflict or an appearance of conflict? Because I deal with that every day at state and federal level. Mm. To me, it's an appearance of a conflict. It's appearance of conflict because oh. I'm working with somebody else that's associated with the town? No, no, no. Just the way it all came about. All right. And uh, you just wanted to the, other, the other parties that are involved. But and anyway, whether we hired you or not, I believe Ridgewood as a town should interview many consultants and then choose. I don't think we should, you know, we should never hire anybody just talking to one person. It should be several, and then we make our decision. But I really appreciate you coming tonight. You have an extensive background, and uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lorraine. Pam? I have no further questions. Good. Um, Matt, Heather, do you have any questions? No, I don't have any questions of them. Good. I don't either. Uh, then I think we need to give our thoughts on whether or not to retain Mr. Primavera. Evan? I mean, for six to $800, I'd love to know more about the history and also understand the SHPO process. Um, I'm, uh, and again, I, I, you know, I'd like to make some of this stuff available for everyone else to see. I mean, it's, as you know, Lorraine said, it's a pretty extensive background. Um, and again, the price here is not exceptional in, in order to try to figure out what we can do and the quickest way to do something. I think it's six to $800 well spent. Siobhan? Um, I, thank you very much for your time fascinating. My sister lives in Margate, so I'm very familiar with Lucy the Elephant. Um, I, I want to be candid outside of you. You've, uh, you have a serious resume. It's great. This project needs help. Um, it's difficult for Evan and I because we joined here, and I've said to Lorraine be, and others, I don't want to criticize what has gone on before, but as a new council member, to get finding information, financials, historic declarations, deeds, it's been rough. I think the public has a need for more information and I think the project needs help being navigated. We've spent, we, meaning the town, as of last week has spent $2.6 million on a house and we have no idea what we're gonna do to it. And I'm willing to bet, not including knockdowns, that that is probably the most expensive house renovation per square foot in Ridgewood, New Jersey. Um, again, that's, that's stunning as the parks liaison looking for the information, finding the information, being new here. I am grateful for everyone's time. There is no doubt that this project needs help. The house needs help and the park needs help. Um, so I think it, you're very reasonable and I would be in favor. You seem to hit a lot of the questions I have. For example, how did all the property become historic and when did that happen? Um, I'm looking forward to a lot of answers to the questions and I just think you know, we talk a lot about fiduciary duty and all of that. I mean, I want everyone to think about that. This house has such value in it. We've taken money from other people and we've returned zero value back to the community. So I think you could be value adding. I'm really hopeful you are. Um, it's very impressive and I would recommend 
moving forward. I also want to say that um, in terms of interviewing other people, Connolly and Hickey is very professional. I think we've made a wonderful choice with them, but we didn't do that for the house. We picked them. They appear to be the right choice, but it is done prior to me being here, and I'm sure it'll be done after I'm here. We don't go around and put that out. The house was made as a decision of council to hire Connolly and Hickey, who we've paid um, close to $200,000, money well spent because they've done a lovely job, but um, I'm in favor of moving it forward. Thank you. Lorraine? I think we need to talk to more people. I just don't think one, we should never just talk to one person before hiring somebody. Thank you. Pam? I'm in favor of going forward. Um, and I, I'm very impressed with the work that you have done. Um, and, and I want to say, obviously, I have a predisposition as to what I think should be done there. Um, however, as you allude to the many doors that you will be opening in this investigative process, um, uh, and while we have an outstanding engineering staff, this appears to me, from what I have learned, to be a specialty dealing with the National Historic Trust, with SHPO, and it appears to me that you have a, a greater understanding um, of how to move this project forward as expeditiously and efficiently as possible, regardless of the result. You said very clearly tonight that you told Chris Rudishauser to stop making drawings. Let me find out what's going on, and then I'll tell you what I think can be done here. Regardless of what we want to put on this property, I think that hiring you is the right avenue to get this project done um, in the best way possible. So I'm in favor of that. Thank you, Mary. If I, if I may address that real quickly. I mean, it, 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 I think any, it, we, we all have the concept of due diligence in our head in a lot of different kinds of transactions that happens there. And there's a lot that's been going on in this property from getting the money to fit the house without really knowing what the program was to the National Register nomination that was done and there's problems with the National Register nomination. Uh, let's get the due diligence together before you spend any more money and end up with something you don't want or isn't what you want or isn't right for the property. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Thank you. And let's move on with the rest well, of our. Oh, excuse me. I'm so I sorry. have a question. Is it premature for us to vote next week if we don't have the report from Mr. Primavera? I, what he just said, I would think so, but I don't know. I think that we can we can vote on that, and then if it's it's not going to be submitted, and if Mr. Primavera says to us that we need to modify that. Uh, proposal, which is what a majority of the council wants to do now, then we can just do that. Okay. No. I, I, you know, as you saw in the document I submitted, it's, it's very detailed about what tasks are under each un, under each category, and it may be uh, that you know somebody tells me something walking out tonight that I need to start thinking about. You know. I'm not saying there's barrels out there, but you never know. I, I've got a lot of doors to open. Great. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. So we'll go back to our discussion item 9A, uh, awarding a professional service contract. This is for consulting engineers to provide professional engineering services for the South Side Beater Chamber interconnection. This is um, DEP has requested Ridgewood Water to submit a permit for the addition of corrosion control at the interconnection of Passaic Valley Water System and Ridgewood Water. The interconnection is located adjacent to the Ridgewood Water Southside Treatment Facility. Um, by um, interconnecting the distribution flow from the Southside Treatment Facility to PVWC, Passaic Valley Water Commission, um, it will benefit Ridgewood Water's PFOS operations by blending the flow from Southside with PVWC. The improvements will require backflow control for both south side and the PVWC sources. Automation controls between the PVWC source and south side treatment facility to ensure proper blending will be provided at all times. 
So the recommendation is to award a professional engineering services agreement with Suburban Consulting of Flanders, New Jersey, in an amount not to exceed $21,150. And the um, funding is from the Ridgewood Water Capital Budget. Questions, anyone? Okay. The next item is parking. Chris, if you could come up, please. Um, so there's been a request for change to the parking ordinance because motorists are parking their cars on uh, Spring, Ham Spring Avenue Wellhouse Driveway, restricting access to the Spring Avenue Wellhouse by staff. So um, there's an ordinance to restrict parking at the Ridgewood Water Company Spring Avenue Wellhouse. Um, and it basically says no stopping or standing, is that right? Uh, yes, good, e good evening again, Mayor and Council. This is an ordinance that's been requested by <coughs> excuse me, Ridgewood Water initially for the Spring Avenue Wellhouse. After some further contemplation, they feel it also would be applicable to the 20 well, well house and the Paramus well, which is located on Linwood Avenue just across from Solis Court. Uh, I know the Paramus well house does occasionally have uh, residents' cars parking on it because um, it's convenient. Uh, this, this ordinance would provide a mechanism to prevent that. Uh, the ordinance, as I originally wrote it, just had the Spring <laughs> Avenue well house. Um, I would like to add the other two from my conversations with uh, Rich Calby uh, for the council's consideration. What was the third one, 20, and what else? Uh, the Paramus. Paramus Well. Where's that? Linwood Avenue, right across from Solace Court. Oh, yes. And the Spring Avenue uh, facility just off of Spring Avenue by the Hohokus Brook. Okay, so we'll add those. Yep. And, we uh, We'll introduce it uh, next week. Would you add no parking signs? Uh, once the ordinance is adopted, it will be signed. Uh, similar to what we do for any kind of parking regulation we enforce anywhere in the village. Okay. Uh, this has been discussed with uh, the, the Police Department's Traffic Bureau. They have also made some suggestions that we'll incorporate. I just have a question. So when we pass this, we send it to the neighbors? Or we just post it. Excuse me. When we pass, we just post it. Okay. 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 Is it the neighbors parking there though? Uh, sometimes. <coughs> excuse me. Sometimes it may be neighbors, but on the premise well house it might be convenient. It's convenient to people who just want to take a stroll down along the Saddle River because that leads all the way down to the duck pond. Okay. Thanks. Anyone else? Okay. Good. Um, Chris, just stay there. Um, at this point, I have um, Chief John Judge come up regarding um, increasing fees for the Ridgewood Fire Department. I'll just have him um, explain to you what he's done, and um, it's for your consideration and part of our budget discussion. As you know, we're looking for other revenues. We do um, update our, our um, fees periodically, and it's come to the point where the fire fees that we should do so at this time. Good evening. Uh, just reviewing some of the fees that some weren't updated since 2011, some in 2019. Uh, we went back and took just a quick look at what we had and did a small increase on many of the fees here, as you saw before you. I did provide some scribbled handwriting so you could see kind of what they went from to what they went to, as well as a clean copy so you could see what they currently are. Uh, I took a look around some other uh, towns around us. We are equal to some. We're a little higher than some in some areas, and we're actually a lot lower in some areas as well. So kind of just a mixed bag there of everything. So we have an increase in four years and 12 years on some of them. Anybody have any questions? No, um, all, all, I'm sorry. Um, if I'm reading this correctly, you are not raising the prices for smoke detector and carbon monoxide detectors. Is that right? No. So, hold on a second. Just the one fee for the, if it's um, requested more than 10 days after the application, just the one there from 100 to 120? Yeah. And then the other two are remaining the same. Okay. Sorry, was that the section you were? No, you answered my question. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, John, I looked through this, and um, the increases in fees seem very reasonable. And um, certainly, um, putting aside that even the 2019, um, it's been a while 
since 2019 to increase these fees. 2011, I, I, I think, is long overdue because um, we have to keep up with inflation. So thank you very much for undertaking this. Thank you. Because I know it, it certainly helped balance the budget. Thank you, everybody. Thank have you. a nice evening. Um, our next item is changes to the refuse can containers ordinance. So again, Chris, if you could comment on this one. Well, which one was that, Heather? The refuse containers had a flaw in it that uh, was utilized by a defendant. Um, what number is that? 90 91. It's um, application for the permit for containers, for refuse containers. Anyone placing a refuse container on private property? Oh, dumpsters. Well, that's not what it's called. <laughs> it's called refuse containers. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, we're more comfortable. Uh, that's the ordinance calls it a refuse container. Um, we're comfortable with more comfortable with the term dumpster. Um, our code enforcement officer had a trial a couple weeks ago, and uh, to put it bluntly, he got beat because <laughs> the language in the current ordinance had enough ambiguity that uh, he didn't have a case. So what I propose is before the council is a clear permit process that if you're gonna, if a private homeowner is going to get a dumpster for their project, they have to pull a permit. If they only have it for seven days, there's no fee. If they have it for more than seven days, they better come on down on the seventh day and pay the fee. I think you said that somebody wiggled out of a violation. Is that a, is that a legal term? <laughs> make it a term. All right, term. it's an engineering term. Uh, I'm not an attorney. Right, uh, sorry. <laughs> but after court, John did approach me and said, hey, we, I lost this case for this reason. So we took a look at it, and this is what we recommend. Any other questions? This does clarify it. Sure. Thank okay. You. okay. Thank you. I think I think you don't have anything else. So. The only thing, other thing I have is the gasoline and diesel fuel oh, okay. resolution. If we there's any questions, that. Let's gasoline do and diesel fuel. Um, so Thank it's awarding five. a contract under state contract to Rochelle's, Michelle's, um, Clifton, New Jersey, not to exceed four hundred thousand uh, dollars. Again, it's under state contract, and the funding is in the Fleet Services operating budget. Questions? Okay. Thanks, Chris. Good night. Thanks, Chris. Okay. The next item is accepting a donation from RBSA. Um, so RBSA with the, has contracted with an outside vendor to make necessary repairs to the backstop at the Lower Hawes Field in addition to the gate and fencing adjacent to the site. The donation is valued at $1,850. Um, they do not have any applications before any Richard Border Committee at this time. Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. In the cover memo, it refers to repair to the backstop. Right. But then in the invoice, it talks about replacing the backstop chain link two by six. I'm not sure what the two by six refers to. So my question is, are we talking about replacing the backstop or are we talking about repairing it? I think the chain link is a part of the backstop. So I don't think it's the entire backstop they're taking down. But I will check and I'll find out. Thank you. Anything else? No. Yeah. Um, the next item is amending Green Ridgewood membership. Councilwoman Perrin. Oh. Um, yes, this uh, new draft of the ordinance looks good to me, except for in the title, the word composition needs to be spelled properly. And then I also would request that in paragraph A, after the first sentence, can we indent and make a new paragraph so that it signals who the regular members are versus who the liaisons are? You see what I mean, Heather? This is not a, neither one of them are substantive. And we haven't introduced it um, yet. So I'm sorry, what's the, what's the request in A? A, after the first sentence. Right. Uh, with the sentence that, vil that starts, the village Those council, council shall, shall further, further appoint. appoint. Yes. That's where I'd like a new paragraph. Okay. Sure. Okay. And in terms of the typo in the title, are you sure you don't want to leave it as is because it, the, the root word is compost now? 
<laughs> no, I it's thought that would be appropriate for Green Ridgewood. <laughs> um, okay. Never mind, never mind. It was just a, just okay. a thought. It, okay. Could it say composition and terms in that title? Because that is what's discussed below. Is that what section 18-4 is called though, currently? Composition colon terms. Colon's fine. Okay, we'll take a look at what that's called. Yep. Thanks. Okay, okay. Um, the next one is amending the dates for the dining corrals and the pedestrian plaza. Um, the new dates for these two um, events will be June 3rd, 2023 through October 9th, 2023. So that's just to do a new resolution so that we are <coughs> correct and everyone knows when the dates are. Can I just ask why the date change? Yes, um, uh, there is an entertainment committee um, and they asked for a couple of weeks additional time to be able to put together um, all the entertainment. They've got um, uh, plans in place and they, they felt that this would be um, a better setup. So uh, we discussed it and, and that's why we brought it to the council. Okay. Okay, the next item is the shared service agreement for the styrofoam densifier that we own. Um, so both um, Glen Rock and Washington Township are now interested. So um, our proposal was $5 a bag. And um, uh, Sean Hamlin, our supervisor of recycling, is looking at other towns as well. But, um, and I know our mayor is going to be going to his um, mayor's meeting and he'll be bringing that with him for Northwest Bergen. But at this point, we'll do um, shared services agreements for both Glen Rock and Washington Township. Yeah, I'm very excited about this. Um, at the last um, Northwest Bergen mayor's meeting, um, uh, when, I, when I mentioned that we had a styrofoam densifier, um, everybody wanted to find out more about it. So um, I think this is a great opportunity for us to be uh, doing shared services agreements that can help us going forward, and there are there are lots of other areas that we can hopefully follow with this. Okay. The next item is accepting a monetary donation from the Friends of the Historic Zabriski Shedler House Inc. at forty-four thousand dollars, as uh, Ms. Gruber indicated, that was deposited last March. However, um, we never uh, recognized that donation. It is in trust. So it's not going to be spent on anything except the house, but um, we do need to accept the donation. So this is to do that at this time. When did we receive the donation? March of 2022, apparently. So I just wanted to add that um, while we were going through the budget, uh, there was no, on the current financials for Shedler, there is no disclosure of any donations that we've released to the public. And so when we went through, we were trying to figure out where the donations could have come in without the corresponding resolution. We had a meeting with Matt, Heather, the CFO, um, because the donations need to be you know, on the spreadsheet that we've had out to the public. And right now there's zero donations on, on any side. So um, we did, Bob Rooney pulled the check. It was on March 11th of last year. And that we just want to make sure that a corresponding resolution goes forth with it. Um, there was no letter or intended purpose with it. That's what I've been told. Um, there, there was no letter. I was gonna call you tomorrow, Ellie, to see or find out, but we have the check, but we don't have a cover letter. For, it was just a straight donation, and the money has been sitting in trust for a period of a year. So, um, one, I was, I was excited that we found it. I am grateful for the donation, too. I think that we, anytime the village takes money, we have to issue a resolution because it just, you know, it, it's the way that it goes. So before um, we have a subcommittee working to kind of flesh out the details of all the money and where it is, Matt's there, Heather's there, we felt that the best thing was to say thank you. You know, we have the check, which is great. Two, um, it's going to be honored and then the charity will be listed. But as long as everyone, that's it, it was found money. I did ask, because um, I was very excited there might be more found money, but there is no more found money in that. It was just that single check. So when we're updating the financials, you know, I keep saying to people, we're re-releasing the numbers. Um, I am hopeful for a donation line item so people can see who donated it and where it went, you know, what specific area. 
Okay, the next item is accepting monetary donation from Council Member uh, Siobhan Winograd for $1,000, and that is going to the Tree Trust, which I believe she mentioned at the reorganization meeting. Correct. I was on a resolution role, so after we were clearing this up, uh, part of my campaign was that because of the stipend, we all receive a stipend. Um, I wanted to give it back. A third of my stipend was going to the Shade Tree Commission because they will, in honor of Arbor Day, I figured the earlier they could get it, that the trees could go in now. Um, if anybody else on this council would like to donate to Shade Tree, we are accepting donations. Mm -hmm. um, but you just, we need to get it on a work session, and then this will be part of a resolution. So, um, Heather, I know most of us are donating our stipends. Do we have to do a separate motion for the rest of us, or how does that Anything work? Anything that's going to the village. I'm sorry? Not, not if it's going other than the village, but if it's coming to oh, the I village. Oh, I see. If you're donating it back to the village, correct, you need to donate it to charity like I think again most of us are then no. we're good okay then you go I'm waiving mine in like correct the budget do correct I need, do so we, we should yes, yes the residual of what you that's true the residual of what you have left we should do so thank you so we will do that and Siobhan just so you know when you say you're donating a thousand dollars a third uh, of your stipend you know it's I, I know I, I rounded up Okay, I did. It's, it's after I, tax money, I, so you I, will not. Yes, you, I am aware. That's more than a third. So. I'm aware. I, Good. As long as you're aware. aware. Um, I will say, because they're making, I do feel badly about the budget. I do feel badly for the departments. My Shade Tree Commission is very upset with the amount they received from us. And I would like to encourage everybody who feels a shortfall in the tree planting to do it. This is part of. Prior to the budget, I had always planned in going to be another third to Ridgecrest and another third to the Guild, who is going to help Lorraine via Project Pride make Richard sparkle. Um, so. Thanks, Siobhan. You're welcome. Okay, and the last item, if you recall, we did a tree inventory in 2018, and that was for all village street trees. Um, Parks and Recreation is now requesting that this inventory be completed with phase two, which will include the county road street trees and municipal parks. Um, the recommendation is to award a contract to the same company, which is under state contract to Civil Solutions of Hamilton, New Jersey, in an amount not to exceed $26,270. Once conducted, these results will be entered into the village GIS-based inventory and this will conclude the tree inventory project. Funding is through two capital budget accounts. I think this is so important, both for maintaining, knowing how we need to maintain the health of the trees, but also so that we can be eligible for grant money in the future. I, I mean, I agree, clearly. It's a great thing the Shade Tree Commission clearly mm -hmm. wants this, that it'd be money well spent. Okay, so we'll do that. Um, that's all I have. And oh, just one question, Paul. I mean, I, so I know we've agreed to an 11 p.m. curfew. I see a number of people that want to speak. I'm not sure if we figured out how to do this from a procedural viewpoint. I would suggest we go to at least 11.15 or 11.20. That would allow probably at least a half a dozen folks to come in. Um, I don't know if we need to do a formal vote, but I, I would ask to extend some time uh, past 11 o'clock for the people who stuck around this late. Agreed. We need yeah, I'm in favor. I, we've never had a ending on public comment. I think we should let everybody speak. What Evan was saying is that, is that um, uh, a couple of meetings ago, we passed an, a, an 11 o'clock waivable curfew. Uh, and Evan was saying that because we know um, there's uh, at least one person and, and perhaps several who want to speak tonight, that we should waive that curfew till 11.15. And everyone who has Come, uh, suggest had has spoken on it. Pam, myself, and Lorraine have all agreed. Sure. So, and with that, let's go to public comment. Ellie Gruber, two twenty nine South Irving. I just want to tell you that there is a movie on Netflix called Trans America. I believe it's called. And it's about a Ridgewood resident, Varian Fry, who was a member of the West Side Presbyterian Church and a hero. As a matter of fact, you'll see the little street sign, Varian Fry Way. 
This movie is another a version. There's been two documentaries and two books of how he saved so many people during the Nazi regime on his own. Just a Ridgewood guy, lived here for a while, an ordinary guy who decided he wanted to help. And I think it really would be worthwhile for people to note that this documentary, I mean, we should really be proud of him, mm -hmm. proud of the memory. He didn't live here that many years, but he was a hero. And I, I've read a lot about him. He, he was fantastic. Uh, that's number one. Uh, number hey, two. I don't mean to interrupt. You know about the event. I don't know if you want to announce it publicly. We have a speaker coming to speak on very. I, you know, I can't hear a word you're saying. You I'm are sorry. the biggest uh, mumbler of to, the group. There, there's, um, there's a speaker coming, uh, at, I believe, to the Presbyterian Church to speak on Varian Fry on Holocaust Memorial Service, uh, National Mount Memor Holocaust Memorial Day. Um, just, I'm butchering that name. But I, I believe it's April 17th or the 27th, but it, they're speaking on Varian Fry. I didn't know if you knew the date, if you wanted to announce it publicly, but it's, I, I'll certainly be there. Yeah, sure. Well, they've done a lot of tri tri tributes towards him, but I just saw this ad for Netflix, and it was coming out. Um, I was very disturbed at something I heard. I cannot provide a recording for it because they weren't allowed to record it, but months ago, when you had your quote-unquote listening tour to the residents of Shedler, um, the mayor, and you can deny it, but it was said to one of the residents, look, there's nothing you can do about this. We have four votes. We can talk about lights. And that was very hurtful. It wasn't recorded, mayor, so you can deny it or not deny it, but it was said. And we knew from that time on that there was nothing short of a lawsuit that would stop this ridiculous, how, I don't even know the word to explain it. What on earth has gotten into you? Why is this the most important thing that you are doing month after month at this dais? I mean, it just makes no sense. It just makes no sense to me. Um, hiring an expert, fine. I love the fact she said it's gonna be 68 whatever thousand dollars, and it's gonna be more because it's for this phase and for that phase. I see that he's well qualified. He's well qualified in one respect. He gets rid of historic designations when there's building going on. He gets exceptions. He ruins, he works around encroachments. His goal is to get the 90-foot field, and let's be honest, that's what you hired him for. And the second thing is, and I really am at fault for not keeping mentioning this, because everyone says there's no use for the house. Well, that is baloney. There is plenty of use for the house, and we've said it for how many years? Maybe since Isabella Raltano stood up here from 2008, from 2010, on and on and on. What about the house? The east side of Ridgewood has no community center. They have no place to go unless they cross Route 17. We've talked about this. I'm, I'm, I'm astounded that you keep saying that there's no use for the house. Two years ago, we talked about the use for the house. There could be a f parties, there could be lectures. You know, we rent church space, we rent library space to have meetings, to have talks. What are those people going to do? Get in their car and cross 17. They have nothing. They deserve something. And I really resent the fact that you say, no use for the house, because there is use for the house. It's a community house. And to say that there's no use for it is another slap in the face of the people that live on that side of town. I know, Mayor, you say you live on that side of town, but your business is here. You're here a lot. I don't know if you drove your kids across 17 every time they had to go to school. I don't know. But they have no school. They have no school. They have no park. They have no way to get together. And I'm really just tired, tired of people saying there's no use for the house. And the last thing I say is, I know it's older American week or month, and I deserve a whole month, but you've got to stop keeping those bathrooms locked. I've got to tell you, as an older American, I deserve my time. I had a big. And, oh, that's and, all. And you're absolutely right. I had to come back in to get my key card to use that. So thank you, Ellie. Hi. 
I agree, the bathroom should be unlocked. <laughs> um, Susan Ruan, 705 Kingsbridge Lane. I want to begin by congratulating um, Heather. I have spoken a few times and never congratulated you on your um, state recognition, so I apologize. Um, my small protest at earlier in the meeting. Um, uh, um, my small protest earlier in the meeting with the silence just really showed the lack of silence that was coming from the village council and the lack of dialogue, truthful dialogue to the residents of um, Shedler. As pointed out during the questioning, um, there was already discussions prior to this board being, um, I said board, but this village council being sworn in that there were plans for Shedler that wasn't shared with the residents nor anyone else in Ridgewood, probably with the sports group because they were very vocal in the January meeting and very well orchestrated. Um, so there's a lot of behind the scenes dark rooms which comes back to dark negotiations which comes back to being transparent. All this talk about transparency is just a fallacy and it's a sin that the village engineer's drawings tonight were not put on PDF to be shared with people outside this room. Um, and that should be an embarrassment for the village council because again, you're talking about transparency. The, the field was a catastrophe that was way oversized for the, um, for the designated space. And you guys knew that, that's why it wasn't on the, um, the screen because you didn't wanna share it with the rest of Ridgewood. Okay, and again, the transparency. Um, the talk, um, we want to know how much is the consultant's retainer, as well as hourly fee. Ridgewood taxpayers are going to pay sixty-eight thousand dollars, and I've paid attorney fees, and I know that goes sixty-eight hundred. Sixty-eight. All right, sixty-eight hundred. Does it matter? I've paid attorney fees, and I know they go skyrocket and really fast. Hourly rate retainers. They go up. And how much is the village council actually, I mean, village taxpayer is actually going to pay for him? What is the village um, council actually allocating to Peter Primavera? You know, and how many other safety things are not being done because we're paying for him? Glen, Glen, um, Glen Ave is not being paved, nor is the West Sow River Bridge not being repaired. <laughs> Um, and Peter Primavera said um, um, that he'll be working with SHIPA, which is an absolute slap in the face to the village engineer. He had worked with SHIPA for a year and a half to um, create designs for approval for Shedler, which is now being, we're going back to step one and having some other guy come in and do the same work that the village engineer did and the taxpayer monies um, are just going to it. The village engineer gave um, the presentations for the fields with the SHPO work in the December and January meetings. And now we're gonna have to redo all of them. Heck, um, Habernickel Field is a grass field, not turf. So when people talk to us about what we want, we want what Huppernickel has, which is grass, okay? Um, and where is the park in Shedler? I had to laugh at that tonight. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be facetious. There is no park, it is actually a field. And when you guys don't show the design to the residents at home, that's just the lack of transparency again to when, by misleading them to say it's a park when it's an oversized field that people are, that we're now going to spend millions of dollars to pay an outside consultant to circumvent SHPO. Now, um, as for a campaign, pro, um, I had, <laughs> um, yeah, and can we get the village council to promise here and now that the Maroons will never put their temporary lights at Shedler? It's so nice that you guys saying that Shedler won't have lights, but can we have Maroons can we have the village council promise that the Maroons won't put the lights there? Okay, and yes, this is something that we will be reminding residents um, of that campaign promises were broken about Shedler. 
and that other and um, and this village council decided to cherry pick and honor what was being promised for Sheba. Um, we will remind councils that safety was put second. Um, West Glen wasn't paved. The Kingsbridge Road footbridge wasn't picked. And I also want to know how can we talk about the Shady Tree Commission when we're ripping down so many trees at Shedler? Are we again cherry picking which trees are worth honoring to save and which trees are worth destroying? Susan. Thank you. Thank you. That's not I'm working. Eileen is keeping track of it on time. Fretcher de Silva, 521 West Saddle River Road. I just want to respond to some of the comments that were made earlier about turf fields. And, um, you know, I feel a little entitled as well. I'm almost 60 in a month, so I'm a little old. And so old ad adages, I think, are moments of wisdom. And where there's smoke, I believe there, a lot of times, there's fire. And while we were sitting there, it made me think of what we've been talking about for turf. From the, ni from ni from the 1930s to the 1950s, advertising's most powerful phrase was doctors recommend, and that was paired with the, most, the world's deadliest consumer product, cigarettes. Cigarettes weren't seen as dangerous then, but they still made smokers cough. Um, in the 30s and 40s, smoking was the norm, and most doctors smoked. At, at the same time, there was a rising public anxiety about the health risks associated with cigarettes. By the 1960s, within 20 years or so, the evidence against smoking was more than damning. In 1964, the Surgeon General released the first report on the health effects of smoking. After reviewing more than 7,000 articles in medical literature, the Surgeon General conduct, concluded that smoking caused lung cancer and bronchitis. Even though still, smoking is still not barred, uh, there's an age limit because we protect our children. And I say all of this just because I was sitting there and listening to the, the points about turf. You know, there is a rising tide of concerns about the health risks of turf. Now, while it may not be banned now, I, I would ask you to consider in your conscience and in your minds what's going to happen in 5, in 10, in 15, and in 20 years. And while we may not, you know, cure everything all at once, we may not change our flossing materials, I know we are taking little steps. You know, my son hates the, the paper straws. You know, we can't get plastic bags. I mean, that's not, you know, that's a different issue. But we can make this one step by not adding to the number of turf fields in our town. So I urge you to consider that very seriously. Thank you, Fretcher. Well, I am younger than Fretcher. Well, <laughs> Rohan De Silva, 521 West Saddle River Road. I'm actually her, what is it, boy toy? That's it. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm really disappointed. I'm disappointed in, in the council. I'm, I'm disappointed in Siobhan for, for voting to have a, have a field with turf, as with uh, the mayor, and with Eric. You know, Eric? Uh, Evan. Sorry, Evan, Evan. Evan. You know, sometimes you get what you ask for. I hope your children never suffer any cancer-related uh, things due to, due to your desire to have them play on turf. Now, I know, as a victim of an ACL issue, that it can happen on turf, too, as well as with uh, grass. Uh, in fact, both my knees. It was rugby, not, not anything else, but uh, you know, it happens. So I can't, and, and I find it completely out of order that the mayor started this last November, that there's a, there's a record of an email from last November where this, 
this wasn't in play. So I, th it seems to me that this is a train that you know we as a community are trying to stop. But you all have this plan already. And if this plan is in there, I wonder what else is there. So th that goes back to the transparency argument. I'm not sure that you all are be behaving in the best um, uh, the best uh, circumstances for the village of Ridgewood, for all of the village of Ridgewood. And, you know, so children have to stay in, and, you know, that's a parenting issue. You shouldn't let your children play on devices or phones. You can engage them in many other ways. I have four children. They didn't have phones until actually the high school coach said that he had to have a phone because that's the only way he's getting the updates for the matches. Um, Coach Aiden McCluskey said that about Elijah. So, you know, so what if they could? It's rain. Everybody gets rained out. Not a big deal. Just keep moving, keep it moving. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Rohan. Christina Million, 530 West Saddle River Road. Just had a few notes and more questions that probably won't get answered. Um, there was a comment about the trees on top of the berm and how many we would lose. I think the question is how many acres of trees will be removed for the field because if you've been over there recently, the trees are dead. I don't even know why we put a big giant tree on top of a berm, but they're dying. So that, that ship has sailed. Um, I haven't looked closely at the uh, hard copy document of the new plan, but I don't know where the 60-foot netting is going. If someone could help us out there, that would be terrific. Um, it's been an exciting night of on-the-record comments by a lot of people here. Um, but I agree that I think we should uh, cast a larger net to get in some qualified people to be our quote-unquote historic consultant. And in 2023, especially when diversity and inclusion is so important for so many, I do not think we should just be handing contracts out to a white man. So I also would like you to prioritize DEI. Be really great. Um, you still haven't answered why you classified him as a lawyer twice. That would be great to know. And the house. Um, you know, personally, we haven't been able to focus too much on the house because we've been dismayed by you re ignoring resolution 18236 and we've been a little preoccupied talking to our neighbors who are concerned about their water being poisoned by the turf field that you all are going to be put in so when i hear about oh you haven't talked about the house yet yeah well we have been a little bit busy with other issues that you've put on our plates now thank you thank you christina Good evening, it's almost time for breakfast. And I appreciate the time you're giving us to speak. My name's Nick Einillion, I'm from 477 Colonial I'm Road. I'm sorry, your name again? Nick Einillion, and I think a uh, number of you know me, a uh, number of the council members know me as a Ridgewood Jamboree superstar, and some of you know me as uh, a sports dad, um, and uh, Attorney Rogers, of course, knows that uh, of all the sports dads out there, I probably knew the least about what the kids were playing, but that's okay. I was enthusiastic. Football Scholarship Committee, Ridge, uh, Ridgewood High School uh, hockey team, uh, the, uh, their treasurer for several years. So I get it. I get it, and it's important. But it's very important to have a field. I, I don't doubt that at all. And we've got to have a good place for the kids to play. There is a lot of pressure on the various fields throughout the town, so it's necessary. I understand completely. Now, I mentioned those two occupations as my day job. I have this little side job as well. 42 years I've been a real estate owner, manager, developer, uh, you know, brokerage, the whole thing. And I just want to talk about the basic idea of good development. One of the hallmarks of good development is doing things that are in character with the surroundings that you're developing. So I urge the council to consider that very, very carefully, okay? 
Character is a good word. I mean, we have a wonderful character. The village of Ridgewood has wonderful character. And character is a perfect word. In my mother tongue, I'm not, English is not my first language. In my mother tongue, there are two words that make up the word character. One is the word for picture. The other is the word for drawing or writing. So it's a snapshot, if you will, of a still photo or a still painting of what our essence is. So we need good, solid, responsible development in good character with our town or village. Uh, and we need to do that very, very carefully. I, I totally see the reason for a field. We need the field. But I'm reminded by, I'm reminded that there's only one game that can be played at a time. It's not like, it's not a situation where making the field larger allows you to have multiple games at the same time. It's one game at a time. So it, yes, it takes significant pressure off the system throughout the town, uh, scheduling wise and so on, but it's still only one game at a time. So I would urge the council to look at, let's say the smaller option, the serviceable option that's in the character of the surroundings. I can't speak to whether turf is better than, than uh, grass, I mean, when we were in the first football scholarship committee, attorney Rogers will probably remember that when it was, when the field got muddy on the high school field, we, we put kitty litter down to dry it out. Of course, when it became turf, if a really bad storm came in, there was tens of thousands of dollars worth of repair. I don't know which is better. That I'll leave to you folks. The other thing is, since I'm in the real estate business, as long as you promise not to make me a town official, I have no problem helping with rec making recommendations for professionals. I cast no aspersions on the professional that was, uh, was uh, interviewed tonight. Uh, there are uh, m many people in this field. If you folks are having any doubts or you wish to uh, look into additional uh, parties that might fit the needs, I'm happy to talk to your folks about that. But all I can say is think carefully about the character of our village. Do what is in good character, okay? And I'm going to be bold enough to say many of you have a faith system. If necessary, pray about it. Don't hesitate. Our founding fathers did, and we were better for it. Better for it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nick. Good evening, Ann Loving, 342 South Irving Street. Thank you, Councilman Weitz, for suggesting that we could extend a little bit. I really appreciate it. A couple of uh, things came to mind during the meeting tonight. First of all, I'd like to thank Deputy Mayor Perrin for coming out against the turf. I really appreciate that. That's not gonna happen, but I appreciate you taking a stand. Um, I was very surprised to hear Councilman Weitz say that studies on the hazards of turf are not convincing. Um, I think they were pretty compelling and I think that physician who spoke week after week was very convincing. Also, um, since the uh, consultant that you're hiring has said that nothing can happen this year, I would definitely support what uh, Councilwoman Reynolds seemed to allude to, that maybe we could take the $500,000 out of Shedler in the budget and move that to the sidewalk project and the bridge project. But here's the main thing I wanted to say. It's now spring and along with the many joys of the season come the application of dangerous pesticides by landscape companies as well as businesses that specialize in insecticide treatments. Many companies apply pesticides monthly via fogging to the lawns, trees and shrubs of their clients. The technicians who do so often wear full respirators and protective jumpsuits. The disclaimers and warnings about these poisons regarding skin and eye contact as well as inhalation risks are frankly alarming. They are, after all, poisonous chemicals. As always with such matters, the risks increase for those who have respiratory disorders, are elderly, or are otherwise compromised. Repeated exposures amplify the negative effects. 
Homeowners who contract with these companies are given advance notice of upcoming applications. Their neighbors are not. Richard, Richard Gruenhagen is an environmental specialist from the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection Bureau of Pesticide Compliance and Enforcement. Last year, he was kind enough to speak to me about my concerns. We do not have our property fogged, but several in my neighborhood do. He stated that it is best to have all windows closed when such an application is taking place and to leave them closed for a few hours afterward. No one, including pets, should be allowed outside for this time period. If you're not home or you're home and you're not aware, such poisons can be sprayed into the air without your knowledge. If you are concerned, you could ask your neighbor to let you know when applications will be taking place. If you're uncomfortable talking to your neighbor about this, you can request that the pesticide company give you advance notice. You simply can get their phone number or their email off the side of their truck. Once informed of your wish, the company must comply with the following law, NJAC 7:30-9.15 <laughs> from the New Jersey Pesticide Control Regulation gives you the right to request advance notification from landscape companies contracted to treat a neighbor's property with pesticides. The law also specifies what information the company is required to provide to you after you make the request, such as the specific chemicals, the EPA registration number of the pesticides to be applied, and so on. As a side note, Mr. Gruenhagen explained to me that these applications are actually basically useless. Unless you're having an outdoor gathering or a party a few hours after the fogging. He also explained that the damage to birds and animals who cannot hide indoors can be quite significant. He said that a fan is one of the most effective ways to keep mosquitoes and other insects from bothering people when they sit outdoors, and a fan is obviously risk free, and that's uh, what my husband and I use. Last year, the village manager and Dawn Citrullo agreed to post this information on the village website. Perhaps this can be done again this year so that those who wish to protect themselves will understand their rights under the law. We do all share the air, after all. And thank you again for extending public comments tonight. Thank you, Ann. Evening, Denise Lima, 319 East Glen Ave. A um, few, few topics, <clears throat> so I wanted to just clarify a comment I had made on the internet about uh, the furloughs, and uh, I think we're all excited that you know, we were able to work something out with uh, the employees and the residents. It still doesn't negate the fact that our taxes are going up to 4.3%. It's the third highest in Bergen County, behind Alpine, Demarest, and Tenafly. And there's a lot of towns within Bergen County that still have zero tax increases, uh, significant towns. Um, and I still don't understand why we're not cutting more and doing a better job with that. So I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, I also just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the numbers. Thank you, Heather, for sending what the data was um, that was presented, which was a wide range of age groups a wide range of um, types of sports, not information about 2023, no information about scheduling for 2023, no information about what fields each one of those age groups or types of sports plays on. So now I'm trying to understand how did you leap from that information to making a recommendation for an increased field? because I see no tangible data that supports moving other than there's a lot of data and we need to do something. There's a lot of flooding and we need to do something. Um, I'm trying to understand, in, in, in my company that I work for, we manage a $120 million IT budget and any investment is scrutinized with dollars and facts and scopes and what our return are and our investment is. And I, I haven't heard that here. So another new fact about only one team can play at a time. So what are we really solving for? Is it 1% of the scheduling? Is it 2% of the scheduling? How many kids will be impacted? 
How many kids are we going to make happy? Like, I, nobody has heard all of that, and we keep leaping forward faster and faster. Um, the numbers on that data sheet show that year over year from 21 to 22, the number of kids playing has gone up in double digits, 10 and 11 percent. What are we doing going back to them and saying, whoa, you, you, know, you need to slow down, or how are we working together collaboratively on what they can do versus what we can do, and what other fields? I, I just don't see that whole conversation, yet we keep moving forward. Um, and I keep asking the questions, and um, I, I don't know where we're at with that. Um, the other thing about just history in general, so we probably, I think the next five minutes I'm gonna come back and talk about history. So Washington has spent his most time in any state in New Jersey. He might have spent 45 minutes at uh, the battlefield in Princeton. He spent another several hours in Monmouth. He kept working his way up to Fort Lee. He went through Hackensack. He had a battle in Bergen County. He spent time at the Paramus Church court marshaling people. He had his 400 um, uh, troops and staying overnight for several days. Uh, they couldn't have fit unless they were in the cemetery over the Shedler property. This was all one property, one track. Hohokus, Paramus, Ridgewood was all one track at one point. There were several battlefields here, several books written by very highly accomplished people in the industry. Um, what I suggest that you hire is not only somebody that understands how to navigate, super important, as we know, it's totally frustrating, um, but also somebody that really understands the local history. Because Northern New Jersey gets left out on African Americans, underground railroads, uh, what Washington did here, what he did on his way down the Old Post Road up to Saratoga. People just leave us out. They, they think they don't understand our history up here. So you really need to hire people that understand not only the navigation, but also the history. Um, and, and we just need to keep thinking about that. And unraveling it, um, I think, is, is a hard thing to swallow. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Yeah, Rorick Holloway, uh, 1 Franklin Avenue. It might be a good idea for the mayor and the village council to agree on rules in a sense that it should be a two-way street uh, you, you, no one can do anything about uh, mindless comments being made by people on the dais or people on the floor here, but people can do something about nasty comments being made. And in my humble opinion, the comment that Lorraine had made, uh, doubt, casting doubt on your integrity, is a nasty comment. And I have felt I had to say something about it. And this is one. Uh, secondly, as far as PFOS and as far as the uh, uh, a lawn uh, to turf versus the artificial turf, there are some theoretical uh, risks to a artificial turf, but then I can also tell you there are real risks to a grass field. I mean, that has to be fertilized twice a year. That has to be treated with insecticides once or twice a year. That has to be mowed once a week. And, the, and then we remember all the stuff that we had gone through about banning f uh, mowers and banning blowers, etc. cetera. And uh, so I think with these things, it's not, it isn't black or white. It's, it's the shades of gray, if, uh, if you will. And I just don't think the PFAS is, presents such a risk that it is you can do it, but you can have a, 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 a regular grass uh, field, if you will. Also, I was surprised to hear that five houses in Ridgewood aren't connected to Ridgewood water. Uh, that I find so hard to believe. And I would call up Rich Calbi and make sure they get connected at some point. Uh, now, <clears throat> I was very pleased to hear uh, Peter Primavera and I know about five years ago, I had uh, given a couple of comments about the fact that uh, we shouldn't spend a, a penny on the, the Shedler House until we prove why it is that it is so uniquely historic, what the cost is going to be. And remember, the cost in the last five years has gone from 250000 to 750000 
to 2.6 million, if you will, and for no good reason. And what the use is going to be, and then for, for us to be told there is a use for it, and it's a, it's a place where people from the neighborhood can meet, uh, uh, or even worse, when people say, oh, we're going to have weddings there. I've been in that house. You couldn't have a wedding there, period. It's just silly to even say that, if you will. Uh, and frankly, I just think it's just too bad that uh, we did not have a consultant like Peter Pervera five years ago when everything was just focused on the house, the house, the house, and the house. Now the focus is on the field, the field, the field. People ignore the berm, which is the most ludicrous thing that, that could ever have been done. The next most ridiculous thing is the house itself, and I've been in it. Maybe not rightly, but I was in it. And why $2.6 million has gone into it is just beyond comprehension. So uh, anyway, I welcome hearing from Peter. And I think we should look, take a fresh look at the, the, the whole field. And I also would ask people to start talking about the fact a small field, a big field, you, you destroy the ecosystem. Could someone explain to me what it is that you could be destroying the ecosystem with when you have a bigger field there are than a small field, it's silly. Thank you. Thank you, Rurik. Anyone else? And with that, I'm going to close. Oh, no, we have several people online. And the first one is Lori Weber. Lori. Good evening, Lori Weber, 235 South Irving Street. And once again, thank you for remembering us out here. Um, so I have a few comments about the Shedler discussion. Um, the comments, uh, we have PFAS everywhere. So uh, you're admitting that you are willfully increasing the community's exposure to PFAS as if such an observation somehow justifies forcing Shedler neighborhood families to drink and bathe in carcinogens every day. The evidence of health hazards from artificial turf is inconclusive. Tell me, is anyone up there on the dais drinking unfiltered Ridgewood water directly from the tap? No one is getting everything they want. Uh -huh. I, I, it looks to me like uh, the sports families are. Um, unless we're willing to rip out the artificial turf fields we already have, we might as well install another one, really? Uh, I mean, uh, and the public needs more information, was an observation made. Well, yes, we actually do. And it would have been helpful if the council had displayed the diagram of the, the latest proposal for the Shedler property so that the public could actually see what was being discussed and get something meaningful out of that discussion. So that's it for tonight. And uh, it's a long one for you guys. So thank you for sticking it out with us here. Have a good night. Thank you, Laurie. Catherine Schmidt. You're up. You're on mute still, Catherine. Still on mute. There you go. Okay. Uh, Catherine Schmidt, 123 South Irving Street. I just want to echo how su the surprise that people had when we heard the PFAS discussion today. And the fact that it's all around us, so in a sense, what does it matter if we add more? You know, what does it matter that there were so many uh, fluorocarbons in the air, but today the ozone layer seems to be healing? What does it matter that the Hudson River was so polluted, but finally people took steps to not do that, and today the Hudson River seems to be coming back? You know, what does it matter? People are smoking all over the place, but today you can't smoke in offices, you can't smoke on planes. What does it matter? Women are not being paid the same as men. Today, strides are being made in that regard. So, you know, I just really want to say, as others have echoed, do we really want to be on the inclus in inconclusive or perhaps the wrong side of health history? And I really would be very interested in knowing what our health department thinks about 
uh, a turf, adding another turf field. I agree we can only control what we can control, but we can control what we can control. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And with that, I'm going to close public comment. Again, I want to thank everyone for their passionate but incredibly respectful comments in this very, very hot button topic. So, and with that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. No, no there's a closed session resolution. Oh. Ah. Be it resolved by the Village Council of the Village of Ridgewood that the Village Council meet in closed session on April 3rd, 2023 at 7.30 p.m. or as soon thereafter as the matter on the agenda can be reached, and that said closed session be held in the fourth floor caucus room of Ridgewood Village Hall, 131 North Maple Avenue, Ridgewood, New Jersey. And be it further resolved that the matters to be discussed in closed session are limited to personnel emergency services. These matters are allowable under NJSA 10 colon 4 dash 12 at SAC. And be it further resolved that the minutes of this meeting shall be made available to the general public when such matters have been deemed completed by resolution of the Village of Council. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. All in, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Perrin? Yes. Reynolds? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? Yes. And Vagianos? Yes.